Hello everyone, this is Caillou, and I'm back here with Dodger and Pipsqueak, and today we're going to be reviewing the MS3 bonus sheet. So MS3, which stands for MSEM Masters 3, is the 2020 iteration of a yearly series of sets, which takes a bunch of cards from MSEM, puts them together to create a brand new and exciting limited format, and also re-arts all of those cards in the process, giving some new options for uh, people who like playing the cards that are uh, reprinted. It also has the thing that we're going to be talking about today, the bonus sheet. Uh, the form of this varies each year, but the idea is that it's um, a set of cards which allow the community to contribute to the format directly um, without having to uh, put in a full set. So this year we had 11 cards, from one each, from each of the sets that didn't make it into the format this year, and then 30 cards which were various slot fillers for the limited environment that were is submitted by uh, MSCM community members. So we're going to be going over each of those today. Um, yeah, and I think the cool thing is that the 30 cards that are slot fillers are actually going to be draftable in the MSC, or sorry, in the MS3 set proper. So um, that'll be a cool thing to have your cards be part of limited archetypes as well. Yeah, it was a really great opportunity, and the only requirement um, was that someone had played at least five games of MSEM or had played in the GP. Um, so we had a bunch of cards from people who don't have sets in the format yet. So that was also exciting in a bunch of other ways. Yeah. So yeah, um, I think in general, um, it, it, it's sometimes easy to forget that even though we're a community of like custom magic design, set design is not for everyone. But some people are really good at making individual card designs. And I think that like being able to create a space for those people too is cool. But yeah, so let's get into talking about each of the individual cards and the roles they may play in a competitive MSEM or non-competitive, either way, just what fun things they'll do. So our first card is Aberrant, uh, Abhorrent Academic. It's two and a black for a two-two. You skip your draw step. Your maximum hand size is equal to Abhorrent Academic's power. What's going on? It's third ability um, where it really kicks in. Oh, sorry. No, no, you go ahead. Sorry. Um, at the beginning of your upkeep, if you have fewer cards in your hand than your maximum hand size, you draw cards equal to the difference. So, it's... Oh, and sorry. I think we should give a brief note whenever you read one of these cards off. This one was designed by Avery. Uh, so, shout-outs to her. Shout yeah, shout-outs to card, Avery. I mean, a lot of the rares are like this, but this card is just such a dodger card. Like, I look at it and I'm like, <laughs> okay, I know this is busted if you can take full advantage of it. Like, this is obscene if you can take full advantage of it. The only question is, can you actually do that? Um, and that's approximately the part of deck building where I just think, no, this is too hard, I'm going to switch to playing Axions instead. But, uh, Dodger, like, what are your plans with this card? So, um, there are a couple things that I note when you look at this. Uh, the first thing is that it's a CMC3 black creature, which is, like, prime under yeah. material. Um, the second is it also lets you get cards into your graveyard. Um, again, Prime on Earth material. The the biggest issue here is that on your on its own, you have to be consistently emptying your hand to get value out of this. And if you are doing that, you are drawing two cards a turn, which is nice. Um, I think the way that this goes really nuts is obviously when you're buffing its power. So I'm kind of looking at cards that want to go in an auto shell, but also have the poss the potential to buff your other creatures while also being, you know, reasonable magic cards in themselves. And honestly, I don't really have a ton of ideas for that yet, but I haven't done a ton of research into what kind of stuff could go well with this. But I do think, like, oh yeah, persevering this is great, um, obviously. Like, that's, that's a super great interaction already, because the difference between this being a 3-3 and being a 2-2 is huge. Like, Honestly, just Persevere might make this card good enough already. Um, because, like, this being a 3-3 three, three legitimately means you're probably going to be able to draw two cards every turn. Um, assuming your deck is low to the ground enough. And it also gives you reasons to run cards that empty your hand, like Deform Sanity, which previously I had experimented with in Unearth decks, but had felt a little disjointed with what the rest of the deck wanted to do. So um, I'm excited for this. I think that... There's a couple really interesting questions this card asks, and I think I'll enjoy figuring out the answers. Have you played Mismatch Bandit before? I don't even know what that card does. Uh, let me um, look it up. One in a black, two one menace. 
it's from Tournament at White Run. It has, at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent has more cards in hand than you, you draw a card and lose a life. And that card and this huh. just go really great together. Because you can stack the triggers to basically always be drawing that extra card. Oh, that's true. Yeah, I feel that. Um, I'm not sure. I also think, I, I think of course, if you're... Academic is like kind of close to a three mana Aberracious Dragon. And like, yeah. it doesn't have the body to back it up. But in terms of like the, oh, well, you're losing value, but you're potentially drawing two cards turn, it's like, I'm just thinking like that's kind of a really close comparison to how Aberracious Dragon played. But. So the main the main problem is that you need to actually be able to empty your hand, and there's also potential for you to just get stuck with cards in your hand. Um, yeah, I mean, don't play this if you can't cast at least one spell. Ideally, cast yeah, one and spell. if you if you do draw two lands, that means you're not going to be able to draw another card. Both, no. Or well, you're not going to be able to draw two more cards unless you have some kind of discard outlet. So. There are some there's some puzzles to figure out there and how to exactly optimize. And I'm not actually sure that Mismatch Bandit and can also go in the Unearth deck specifically, but mm, that's um, you don't have to run this with Unearth. Yeah, and in MSCDH, I'm kind of wondering if there's a way to use this as like baby Damia. But because I think in MSCDH you can definitely like take more advantage of the uh, increasing its power part of it. Because in MSC Improper, that's just a clunky combo. Or, like, you have to really make it incidental. Well, here I think that, like... Or I think it's easier to do... To have incidental ways to increase power, like, do... Or, like, have weird synergies like that. That can make a and Academic uh, really pop up. Yeah, this, so. this is a nice Voltron target for ADH, I think. For sure. It's a shame that it's not a legend in that regard. Uh, yeah. Okay, oh, yeah, it would true. be sick if this was a legend, like, Baby Damia, even more secured. Actually, like the build, and like it would be, a, it would be a really sick build round. Honestly, how do most copies of these of this card work? Like, does the does the most recently played one determine your maximum hand size? Yes. Okay. Timestamps, uh, baby. Wait, uh, I, I, yes, yes, that's how it works. Okay. I just like had a second question in terms of like, does it get reset when you change its stats? Like, does it check? I'm guessing, it, but it doesn't. I'm guessing it wouldn't. No, it does not. Okay. Um, what card's next? It's Isla Forest Visitor. Um, so this one was designed by Turn One Soul Ring, which you know what? I'm gonna be real. That's very surprising considering a keyword we're gonna read on this card. Um, <laughs> so it's two green and a white for a three-three legendary creature, Human Scout. Whenever one or more counters are put on a permanent you control for the first time each turn. Create that many 1-1 one, one green squirrel creature tokens. And then it has 3 mana proliferate. Of course, this this feels like uh, a beautiful love letter to the kind of things that uh, Dravos Argentium, another player in our format, loves. It has proliferate on it, so that's already enough, but just the general like token synerg- or counter synergies. Um, it makes squirrels. It makes squirrels. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. Like, at 4 mana... In MSCM, I think like it's one of those things where like I could kind of see it, but not. Re- but like, it's I'm gonna leave talking about the the maybe MSCM uh, applications of this to you guys. Of course, in MSEDH, this just is kind of nutty, and I um, very much look forward to people uh, building with it. It feels like a quintessential uh, commander card. It has I think so two sets of build arounds, both of which are very green white, so you'll have ample support. And it's very powerful if left unchecked. Yeah, I think this is the Stone Cold Nuts in EDH. I think in MSEM, if you're running it, it's part of some kind of degenerate combo. Um, but otherwise, I don't really see the use for it. It's too clunky. takes too much mana investment. Unfortunately, awesome. it has that pesky first time each turn text, so you yeah. can't even go infinite with it, for shame. It's hard to. Um, it wouldn't. I wouldn't say, like, infinite. I would say, like, if you're doing something each turn that maybe has some kind of cascading value from creating a bunch of squirrels or something like that, like I could maybe see this being worth inclusion, especially if your deck is ramping or has ways to like, I don't know, establish congregation into play or whatever kind of stuff you're doing. I don't know. You curve this into Cornrows the Mighty, and Cornrows the Mighty entering the battlefield creates six squirrels immediately, and then you buff oh. up the squirrels. I forgot that this works with walkers just entering. Yep. That's kind of neat, actually. I like 
But that means that if you play this in a deck with a lot of walkers, it's kind of just a kill on sight, or your opponent just gets buried in, in tokens. So you know the most fucked up thing you can do with this? You play this, and then you um, you play this, you gain a little bit of life, you're doing like some Soul Sisters thing, and then for one black mana you play Herald of Oblivion. Huh. Yeah, that's uh, pretty good. That makes a million... And you generate problem... X worlds where X is the uh, is your life total. The problem is now you're playing a Soul Sisters deck with Herald of Oblivion in it. And uh, <laughs> and this card. Yeah. Maybe maybe not even Soul Sisters. Like, is just. I mean, do you need to be gaining one... life. Like, you yeah, could... that's like four plus one mana Storm Hurt is actually kind of good when you think about it. Yeah, that's true. Um, I kind of buy that. Also, um, my question is, if you proliferate this, or if you proliferate with this, and you put counters on like three things, do you get you... one squirrel or three squirrels? Um, it says like, a permanent you control, so okay. you would only get one scroll. Got it. Um, which is mildly awkward. Like, I don't yeah. think that's intuitive, but yeah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, I think this is overall like a fun commander card, and um, if you really want to, you can do some weird things in MCM with it, but I that's doubt you're going to be breaking it super easily. Like, I don't think this is a card that, like, oh, keep an eye out for it, it's going to do degenerate things, but I think if you really want to play this thing, there are some kind of stupid things you can get up to with it. I yeah. think the main question is, if you're, like, why are you using this uh, over Avatar Plume to Ball? And the, and the answer is that it generates its own tokens, and so you have some, like, uh, like it's, yeah, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's not dead on its own for what it's worth. Yeah, and this does, do, this does like, have recurring value, whereas Avatar kind of relies on you combining with other things um yeah mm -hmm. but yeah i think in in most of those uh go ham decks they'll probably run avatar but then i could definitely see yeah. this as like not copies five through eight but another enabler maybe like copy five <laughs> yeah yeah Cur curving katie into this doesn't suck either yeah that's true i don't know there's a lot of things i'm just looking at this card and being like these just don't suck like you can do Katie's this and it's not great, actively embarrassing. It is a great way to buff up the board of squirrels you just made. Yep. Um, it's a good way to, like, it's a decent proliferate target in both directions. Like, getting to activate KD more often is really busted. Um, KD means that you can play this and immediately get value the turn it came down. KD's just a good card. Man, yeah, I'm right. killing KD really hard these days. Yeah, speaking of a good like, card KD that you brilliant. created... <laughs> Let's talk about the next card on this list, Call of the Clock Tower. Oh, jeez. <laughs> this card kind of scares me a little bit, not gonna lie. <laughs> Matt was like, fucking... Matt outright said, someone should really give me a brain freeze. I really want a brain freeze for this limited. And I was like, alright, let's see what I can do. And so I did this. <laughs> and basically, immediately after designing it, I was like, I'm kind of worried about this in limited, let alone constructed. Like, in constructed, I think it's kind of nasty, but it's not, like, terrifying. But in limited, if you have, like, four or five artifacts, you probably kill someone with this. <laughs> I think this is much, much better in limited than in constructed. Yeah. Um, the scary part is, watching... like, I don't even think you need to, like... Because this is for, like, the artifact storm archetype, as it's, like, a brain, as right. it's, like, a brain freeze spec. I think you can even just have this with, like, some of, like, the... Uh, there's like the inscribe thing which creates like an equipment token each turn like you can have like oh, a yeah. bunch of like dinky tokens lying around and then be like uh get alt when conned and it's like, like oh shit <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i i also remember chef drafted the archetype and had five copies of Wordatome, which is a common in that set yep. so yep. like yeah that's legit i think um in standard or sorry not in standard in mscm i think that this is probably not as powerful as some of the other artifact payoffs that already exist, but it doesn't have as much deck building restriction. So, like, if you are sure that you're going to be generating a ton of artifacts, and there are ways to do that still, even with the banning of Eleven Tower Breakthrough, this isn't as mana intensive. You can you can just you can play this. You can even like recur it with um, I don't know whatever sort of recursion method you want to do. Remember for centuries maybe. Um, Can't answer. Cane Dancer, that's perfect, yeah. Um, and you can just go, like, call the Clock Tower Cane Dancer for, you know, 
uh, six times however many artifacts you have. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, this is very powerful. Um, I would I would absolutely not be shocked if there's a combo deck in MSCM that kills with those. I, 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 honestly, I, I, like, <laughs> it, it would yeah. be hard, but it would be kind of sick. I mean, it's not that hard. Rail lines exist, currency exists, Lotus Studies exist. 11th um, hour breakthrough is dead, though. Rest in pussy. No, but yeah, it, but like, mm -hmm. 11th hour breakthrough was in a deck. It wasn't like the deck. So I still think that this card definitely has legs. Mm -hmm. Just because really, it's so cheap. Yeah. I think, so... I think we, pro we probably have to do some math on like the numbers needed for it, but yeah. I'm mostly trying to think, like, what are the... So, one of the stupidest things I thought of with this card is you cast this... Oh, no, sorry, that doesn't work. I was thinking, like, something <laughs> that involves mass recursion. So, like, you target yourself with this and put a bunch of shit in your graveyard that can all, like, just be so recurred. You can, I was about like, to just Sharoom, but that doesn't work. You can mill yourself... You can target yourself and then do a Curse by Unborn Fates or something, but... yeah. That seems less efficient than the current Accurse by Unborn Fates combos. I mean, the current ones are 5 mana. Yeah. This is 2 mana plus 4 mana. So, that's 6 mana. Yeah, but you that's also need to get a bunch else. of artifacts, which yeah. often will muddle from your deck's overall plan, so I don't know. Alright, maybe I will not be targeting yeah. myself with this card in the near future. <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe but if thanks, you want to Hopefully we don't have Brain Freeze Breach in this format. What, what if you're trying yeah. to lab man? Maybe you... Maybe you mill yourself then with this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Or if you're trying to turn on an, uh, another card we're going to see from the very end of this review. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we'll get to that. For now, let's stick to talking about uh, the blue-red artifact storm archetype with Core Charge. Uh, this one is uh, by one of the people at the table. So you want to talk about it? Sure. So uh, this is one of the two cards that um, I have on the bonus sheet. Um, it's eight mana. Uh, including a blue and a red, but it has effectively affinity for artifacts, so it costs one less for each artifact to control. And what it does is you draw three cards, and then it deals damage to any target equal to the number of cards in your hand. Um, so I think I designed this specifically for the blue-red artifacts archetype as the Archon. Um, and the kind of inspiration I got for it was that Matt said that they weren't really in need of an enabler, they were in need of a finisher, right? Um, so kind of in a similar vein to Call of the Clock Tower. The archetype already has a bunch of stormy properties. Um, I wanted to make sure I had something that maybe could help you, even if you were still in the process of comboing off, but could also be used to just finish off your opponent. Um, and the, the, the ideal scenario for this card is absolutely nuts. Like two mana could, could potentially be like a draw three, deal five or six, um, which is absolutely broken, right? And... All it asks of you is have six artifacts, which is something that we've seen constructed decks are already capable of doing, right? Um, now, 11th Hour Breakthrough being banned makes that a lot harder, but I still think that this card is worth building around, and I think that even in MSCM proper, I think that there's enough support that you can maybe try to chain a couple of these together and blow someone up. Yeah, um... I mean, I'm excited for this in Limited, obviously. I think it's probably powerful enough for Constructed. The main issue I think this has is basically identical to the same issue with um, the uh, Dwemer Bound Phantasm, or whatever it's called, mm -hmm. um, where it's only good once you've established your board presence of artifacts. So if you're... It, it does give you another way of gassing back up, of dealing a bunch of damage, etc. Like, I think past iterations of 11th hour breakthrough type storm decks would have loved this um but singularis grasp is a card that's very much on people's radar so i'd be a little bit scared bringing a deck that really wants to hit six artifacts on the battlefield as fast as possible yeah i think that running this card is not a very good four of i think unfortunately just because if you do get stuck with like two or three copies of this in your hand especially in your first like 10 cards that can make it tough to actually cast them um, but they do chain well into each other, so maybe maybe the correct number is three. Um, and like honestly, if you cast two of these when with your hand at like four or five cards, your opponent probably just dies. Oh yeah. Considering they've like considering that they've paid some amount of life to their lands. I mean, we've seen how powerful Glitch is, and this card draws one more card. 
than the first glitch activation. So I don't know. Yep. I think we've seen kind of how this effect plays, and it plays well. I think that like if this well one thing is that like, I think if this does become a playable effect, um, I think it'll just add to the number of uh, decks that are looking for direct damage as their win con, and I think that just increases the stock of main deck uh, stand and assailable and other life gain effects. I know Hersey's played around with like heraldry, so I think just like uh, keeping that in mind. Is just something I've been doing more recently, and that just and this just makes that even more salient. Um, but yeah, so next up we have Disciple of Feradia. It's two white and a white for a human cleric, and you might be like, "That's a cleric? Hold on, that's a human. It has wings in the art." But wait, <laughs> um, when it enters the battlefield, you tutor up an angel or aura, and then gain life equal to its converted mana cost. So already pretty powerful. Um, but as long as you have an angel, um, it has uh, it's basically it turns into a four four with flying, and it becomes an angel itself. So you can you can obviously like curve this for merciful Eurotas, but since it doesn't specify angel creature, um, the obvious combo is polyp pools if you're playing this in MSCM proper. <laughs> Which for those of you listening, you don't know what that is. It's a land with changeling. So I don't know how dependencies work. If you have a Paul Pools in play, and you play Disciple of Feradia, and she becomes an angel, and then you play a second Disciple of Feradia, and then you lose the Paul Pools, do you have two angels or no? I think you don't. Okay. I, I could be wrong, but I'm, I think you don't. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be the wrong. The idea that you don't, I think, is the intuitive one. But as yeah. we know, as we all know, magic sometimes doesn't function intuitively. <laughs> yeah, so I think that um, when I'm looking at this card, I'm actually looking for like what are good four and five drop angels that you can follow this up with. And one that I actually think is very interesting is Torella. Um, because Torella, if you cast it, you can uh, aka you can already blink this back to get another Torella, and then Torella will turn it into a four four flying. Um, now, obviously, you can't have a bunch of Torellas in play at once because then uh, they'll the legend rule. But uh, still, I think like having that potential source of kind of an army in a can uh, card advantage is pretty interesting. Um, but obviously, the fact that you, if this is a two-two when you first play it makes it kind of dicey. It's better if you curve it with Yoroda into this, which means it'll come down right away as a four-four. Um, I don't know. It's it's an interesting card. You can also curve uh, Epoch Warden into this. Oh and yeah, Epoch Warden can start flickering it for more angels. That's true. Um, um, we're also getting a another three drop angel in the bonus sheet that we'll talk about later. The other big thing I would note here um, is that it doesn't need to find angels. So if your deck runs like some of our really powerful pacifism like auras, such as Photon Barricade. This can be a modal find you a threat or an answer, and those are the sorts of cards that I think are really important to keep an eye on. Um, it could also like find you a heal out emergence or something. I don't know. Like you can fuck people up. Yeah. Um I'm sure there are a lot of great silver bullet auras to find actually, even ones that aren't removal. I think that this is like a four drop that's a little bit slow for MSEM in terms of if you don't have an angel, like of spending four mana on a two two is like, arch it needs to be archive guardian levels of powerful, but I think this actually might be archive guardian levels of powerful, and it has the upside of being a really good threat if you have Paul Pool or another threat. One area that this might uh, I don't think that I don't know how much of a real deck this was, but then seeing aura and seeing angel uh, on the same card made me think of there was that uh, angel caller uh, uh, oh. aura. Yeah, I don't know how, oh. like, I don't remember the exact composition of that deck, but I wonder uh, if this could, like, go into that and help that shell. Especially because it can tutor angels to hand, which means, like, that's where you need them for Angel Caller. I think, I think this definitely goes in Angel Caller, yeah. This can find your, your genera or whatever other 3 color angel you're using as, um, as 
your enabler, and uh, it also gets ramped into by intercaller, and it and it gains you life. It stabilizes you against aggro. What's not to like? Yeah, in general, I think that the life gain is kind of like the part of this card that I feel like I I, re I register in my mind least often, but it's going to be so impactful if you just have like some natty big angel as as like both your finish or like natty big aura or or angel as your finisher. But you can also just tutor it up in a pinch to be like, oh, okay. Um, suddenly, I've gained back two or three bolts worth of life. Thanks. Yeah, I actually love also, that about this card because incidental life gain is so useful when you need it. Yeah, one, we were we were literally call. just talking about on core charge about like how there's right. a decent <laughs> number of decks in cart that like are trying to win through direct damage. Yeah, for um, sure. Disciple. The one other big thought I had on Disciple is it actually allows you to change the Angel Caller deck uh, to include Puppetize, um, whereas pu where Puppetize is a aura that uh, enables you to untap enchant a creature. Um, no. It's five mana, so you can curve Angel Caller into this, into Puppetize. Um, oh, that's and awesome, actually. Then generate infinite uh, green and white mana. Assuming you have a Angel in your hand that is blue, green, white. So Wait, that's actually kind it, of it, awesome. Yeah, it gives the deck other lines of comboing yeah. off. This can both find the uh, missing combo piece that goes in your hand, and also the missing combo piece to untap. I know, I know Rosalie was a big brewer with the whole angel caller archetype so maybe uh she'll want to revisit that yep okay, okay. speaking uh, of revisiting existing archetypes i think you should take the next one dodger <laughs> sure so the next card is endless expedition it was designed wow. by featherfall um it is a three green enchantment whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control you choose one um, but if that land doesn't share a name with any other lands you control, instead you get to choose both. And the two options are you make a 1-1 one, one scout, that's all colors, or you put a plus-1-plus-1 one, plus one counter on a creature you control. So this card is obviously um, a reference to the famous Into the Unknown, which is a card that uh, is still quite ludicrous, even after it was nerfed from 2 mana to 4 mana. Um, obviously this card doesn't actually create the tokens on ETB, um, but if you pair this with, you know, like if you build your deck properly and you pair this with fetch lands, mono fetches, and uh, shifting lands, then you could potentially play this and generate like two to three, uh, like power and toughness right away. Um, I think this is generally going to be the worst um, landfall trigger that you include in your Wonderfall esque deck, but it still might make the cut just because. Um, at some point you hit critical mass where like everything is just triggering all the time and it's like you don't actually need to play any like standard fair cards anymore because your deck is just a bundle of um, stuff that all triggers each other and your opponent just dies to this death ball. So I think in, in general I'd be willing to try a couple copies of this but I don't think it's going to go into every Wonderfall deck and it might not make the cut at all. Um, one thing that I said on the Reddit post for this card that I kind of stand by is this card's made it really cool and limited. Like, building oh, yeah. and playing around this and limited is just the hype as shit. It synergizes so well with so many different archetypes. It's great, too, because uh, that the set has common deserts, like um, the, the monocolor deserts that you pay one life. I think they're, they all end in dunes. And then there's also the uncommon cycle of the desert shocks. And those are all really great ways to use this. Um, yeah. And it also goes also... great in the in the green white counters archetype and the black green tokens archetype. Um, maybe missing something. If you want to do something stupid, you can repeatedly replay a prismatic cavern. Oh yeah, that sounds great Which too. Is, uh, also <laughs> uncommon. I mean, yeah, I, I definitely stretch, but <laughs> I definitely expect this to be really awesome and limited for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, the fact that we're talking about it... I feel like if you get even, like, one double proc nice. off this, it's just insane. I don't know about, like... I mean, so the the question is, like, uh, how many triggers do you need before you got your mana's worth? And I'd say, like, four. Um, just because of, like, what's available for for less mana. Like, if you compare this to Splitting Bloom, just in terms of token generation, it's very bad. 
Um, yeah, and if you compare this like, to internet, in terms of like sheer I power, think we were it's almost still. Like just oh, limited. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I mean, I don't think the gray ogre mode is like that nuts, but also like join the colony is a common epithet, and that's actually just how this procs basically. So yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. its base case once you proc it once is kind of nuts. Yeah. Um, and I'm just assuming that like you're you're curving some two drop into this, and then uh, you're you're get like I think like if it was if it's just getting a gray ogre and then some then sure, but then I think like if you like just curve this from a creature and then you get a double proc, it's like oh okay something's happening here. But yeah. Um, right. So next up we have Face of All. This was designed by Hersey, um, and it has a brand new mechanic called Gestalt. If this or another creature you control would enter the battlefield, you may instead merge it over or under the one in play. They become the permanent on top, plus all abilities from under it. Not gonna lie, I'm still not 100% sure I quite understand all the applications of that mechanic, but I'm just gonna let it ride. And um, So, yeah, basically what it does is it automatically makes all of your... Or it doesn't automatically, it, it allows you to automatically merge anything that you play with this as if it's a mutate. Um, so it, it, it basically just gives itself and all of your other creatures mutate. With as long this. as they're going on this stack. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah, so, so, so you like can essentially, obviously... you can treat it as either itself or uh, aura that gives um, your that gives your creature Hexproof, lifelink, vigilance. Well, not really right. hexproof, yeah. but you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, so essentially what this does, like, the actual abilities are lifelink, vigilance, and then whenever an opponent casts a spell, it phases out until end of turn, um, which would, which just means that it, it's treated as though it, uh, it doesn't exist. Um, and the reason, like, that's a downside mechanic, because uh, this being able to apply lifelink and vigilance and gain whatever abilities from other cards you have or apply life and vigilance to whatever other creature you have is like fairly strong um so you generally you're encouraged to make some kind of like voltron um but your opponent has some counterplay by being able to cast instance to stop this um or cast a spell pre-combat to make sure this can't block or something like that um in general, I actually think that the fact that it's it's a mandatory phase out makes me less high on it, just because there are plenty of decks that run lots of instants, and they may may just let the, like never let this thing attack at all. I don't know. Like maybe there's I think some that's kind of entirely fair, but then do. if you're like if you're making them use their combat tricks to like phase this and not actually and like. Like, let's say you're just attacking with this, and then, like, they're forced to use their combat trick just to, like, phase this out. Then it's like, okay, sure. Well, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say combat trick. I would say more stuff like instant speed card draw um, or, like, a removal spell on one of your other creatures. Mm -hmm. Like, are you talking about in those... limited or in constructed? Sorry. I'm talking about constructed. Oh, in constructed, right. I don't yeah. think that this is super great. Yeah, no. In limited, this is really strong, I think, because... The number of opponents who have a lot of instants is probably going to be pretty low. And the fact that this actually saved itself from removal, um, I think it's actually pretty much impossible to kill this with a removal spell. Right? Unless yeah. I'm missing something. Like, you'd have um, to use some kind of ability that can kill it. Yeah, such as, like, their song or something like that. Right. Um, notably, if you've gestalted a bunch, be very, very careful of Lucian the Ravenous, because he will merge <laughs> the entire stack under him. <laughs> he will eat them all. And then, is, and then uh... of course, he's, he'll gain phasing, so then he's just... Uh, or, like, whenever... Unkillable. <laughs> yeah. That is uh, the, pretty spooky. And the more merge cards enter the format, the funnier things get, is kind of how it works. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I think... Again, uh, not to harp on EDH is a place where wacky funny things happen, but EDH is a place where wacky funny things happen, and I'm kind of wondering what people are gonna find with this uh, with this card. Um, 
All right. Yeah, I think that's about it for Phase of All. So next up, we have From Schengen's Heart. This was designed by Cyber Chronometer. I think from a flavor perspective, it is my favorite in the set. Or on the bonus sheet. It's it does a... have awesome player text. It oh. tells the story of Tales of Jiangxi in a single card, mm -hmm. which, which is which I think kind of impressive. What was it? Uh, Tales of Jiangxi was recently re renamed to... Uh, oh. Tales of Jiangxi. Yeah, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. oh. I need but to yeah. memorize that one. Yeah, that was like a reason change, but I'm just trying to use that more. But yeah, yeah that whole yeah. block. Um, so it's three and a black for an enchantment. With At the beginning of your end step, if a card left your graveyard this turn, create a 3-1 black human rogue creature token named Shengen Renegade. And I believe Shengen Renegade is a card from uh, Tales of Jedi, which is, uh, which is a 3-1 mm -hmm. itself, and it uh, leaves your graveyard because it has Revive, one of the set mechanics. Correct. Um, this card, I mean... We waxed on the um, other episode about how good uh, that one from Beyond the Grave card. Yeah, thank you. From Beyond the Grave is from Shinkan's heart is like definitely worse than that in a pretty appreciable way. But making a bunch of three ones is no joke, um, especially in limited. This card's insane. Like if you can proc this, let's say three times in limited, you're fucking golden. Twice is pretty scary. Three times is when it gets, like, nuts. Yeah, I'd say I'm happy if I get two uses out of this. Um, one, I'm unhappy. And yeah. zero, I'm very, very sad. Very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> one, one thing that's also a little bit sadder about this uh, in comparison with From Beyond the Grave is that uh, From Beyond the Grave, uh, I think it, you can also proc it on opponent's end steps. It's your graveyard still, but you can... you can like, if, if you have, mm -hmm. like, uh, a Scooze variant, you can... You like you can keep up the mana in case they have something threatening you want to exile, and then on your end step, just exile something from your graveyard to proc it. Oh, Sh Shenken Renegade is also in the set itself. That's yeah, neat. yeah. <laughs> oh, hey, nice. It's pretty cool. Token efficiency. We'll have to see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, overall, I think that this is a sweet, flavorful card that I appreciate as someone who loves custom lore and the proliferation of that. But as like a constructed playable card, I think that there are better options. But again, in limited, it's a sick engine, so it yeah, kinda, it's a fun it, limited card. Yeah, and I think that's uh, another thing that I like um, is that, uh, like, I guess specifically for this review process, is that usually in this review process we have because sets are so big, we have to like cut out a lot of we have to cut out basically all of like the limited focused cards. So I like being able to like take a moment to talk about them here, and like talk it's as like community submissions and like how they fit into like a limited environment. And I like that MS3 in the bonus sheet gives us that opportunity. Just as like a little meta thing before we move on. So that being said, our next card is Grim Botanist. Um, so when it enters the battlefield, you create a 1-1 one, one green sapling creature token. And whenever a non-token creature you control dies, populate. So pretty solidly uh, Golgari effect. This was created by Infinity Chef. Yeah, I, I don't think this gets there in MSCM, but it's close. Like, it's three mana for 3-3 three, three worth of stats. If you have a decent-sized cre uh, creature token, being able to turn all of your dying creatures into that is pretty scary. Um, but it's hard to, like, really pop off with this, which is a good thing. And I think if you're just cloning the saplings, this, like, just isn't that impressive. I think if I have a way to consistently get a 3-3 three, three with its effect, I'm interested. Yeah. Um, or something similar, like maybe a 2-2 flyer or something like that. Um, an easy way to kind of enable this is with, like, revive creatures. So mm -hmm. maybe maybe if you are running Shengen Renegade, which isn't a horrible card in its own right, right? Like, this is a decent card with Shengen Renegade. So maybe, um, and maybe I run this as, like, an unearth target or something. I don't know. But the in Dodger general, Dodger I think, sees like, three it, mana maybe... is, like, mm, unearth. <laughs> my my nuts idea with this is being able to turn all of my dying creatures into otters. That seems kind of sweet. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Um, but I think in general, my I, I mean, I, this there, is that there are a like, lot of different kinds of tokens. It feels cool, but then also like, I think like three mana is again, like I mentioned uh, on the Mon podcast, is that it's just it's on this little bit of an awkward spot on the curve. Um, 
And I think that like uh, to really like pop off with this or like to pop off at like the degree that I think you would need to to justify this, you need something like Sack Outlet plus Departed Evangel, which is already a win condition in and of itself. So, yeah. So one thing that I would say is um, there's a card called Mortal Will, which is actually in MSC, uh, MS3. Uh, for one black, you can uh, choose a creature, and then when it dies, you make a token that's a copy of it. Um, you can stack the triggers so that you get the token and then you populate. So maybe with a stack outlet or something, you can uh, mortal will a creature, stack it. Um, maybe it's an archive guardian. I was so then say, archive guardian returns mortal will. Uh, returns mortal will. You populate the archive guardian. Now you've got some kind of like weird engine loop going. And maybe if that stack outlet generates you mana, suddenly you've got infinite mana and infinite replays of whatever card you want, right? So that's a neat combo. Um, I don't know if like that there's a deck for that combo, but like I think there's cool stuff you can do with this card. That's fair. Yeah, I think again, like we mentioned earlier that like lots of cards in the sheet feel like very dodger cards, and I think that this is definitely uh, one of those. Just from like think, I, I didn't yeah. like, clock it as that at first, but yeah. I think, <laughs> I think, I think it's overall like and and what like, is... like, huh? Uh, no, no much. But yeah, it's just no, it's generally very like that. synergistic and has like a powerful build around component, but you need to like you need to do your deck building diligence to make it work. But yeah. Mm -hmm. So next up, uh, nice we card. have a character who I think has been very relevant in the greater MSC verse lore, but it hasn't shown up in a uh, in an MSCM set yet. It's Hannah Entelon Prodigy. Um, so it's a uh, two blue and a red for a two two. Um, whenever an artifact enters the battlefield under your control, look at the top card of your library. If that card's converted mana cost is less than or equal to that artifact's converted mana cost, you may reveal it and put that card into your hand. Otherwise, put it on the top or bottom of your library. And this is designed by Cajun, who is uh, not the creator of Hanna, but one of the writers who I think frequently works with our character. I'm trying to think of like where this is a good engine in MSEM, but I'm gonna leave that to you guys since I don't have any ideas. It's it's so okay. The base case is, is if the top card of your library is a land, you draw it. Otherwise, scry one. And that's not bad for artifact TP. It's not nuts, but it's not bad. It's obviously better the more expensive the artifacts are, but I don't think that's actually that realistic in like constructive play. Like, the main way of cropping this is with a bunch of cheap artifacts, other than, like, I guess the rail lines. Um, but I think you might run into hand size issues with the rail lines, so that's a different issue. I don't know. I think I think this card is solidly fine, but I don't think it's going to redefine any archetypes, especially because it is a major lightning rod if you're trying to combo off with it. Yeah, I'm not a fan of casting a 4-mana 2-2 in blue-red of all decks. Um... I think, like, there are ways to, to cheat this out on mana, like maybe you work works beyond it into play or something, but you've got a lot of moving pieces there. Um, you also need to have a lot of artifacts in your deck, so I think in general I'm not super interested in building around this for MSEM proper, but it is a great commander, um, so it definitely has at least that going for it. Yeah, I think that like I like this for Commander, where you can actually reasonably play, uh, play this into large scale artifacts, and then maybe do some like dumb loops with it. Um, so yeah, with uh, EDH is where I'd look to put my brewing hat on and uh, try this out. For sure. So next up we have Imaginative Dreamer, which is another Hersey design. Um, it's uh, green and a blue for a 2-2, two -two, but it uh, enters the battlefield as a copy of a creature, but then stops being that creature after it enters. So essentially, the way you can think about this is it uh, copies a creature's ETB effect. Um, there are some other, like I think, weird niche stuff you can do with it, but that's the most straightforward uh, uh, interpretation of this. I think that like yeah. being, being, I think like being cheap um is something that is makes this a lot more intriguing than uh, i think few of the other cards we've been looking at i think at two mana this is like 
the type of card where I'm like, eh, like the value it provides is something that I'd like look at and maybe there's something like really synergistic or degenerate I can do with this. The question is basically how much mana would you be willing to pay for a 2-2 two -two that Aetherize is on ETB? And the answer historically has been, well, I might play Familiar, which has Flash and is like a 2-1. But Flash makes it so much better than Imaginative Dreamer, it's not actually that <laughs> funny. Like, Imaginative Dreamer, unless it's entering as a copy with a creature with haste, no, that doesn't even work. It, it literally work. is just it literally is just getting the ETB. So I don't know. I think so. Just there, play there are a couple. Familiar. There are a couple potential scenarios where this is different. Um, because you can stack the triggers however you want. You can have it stop becoming a copy before the actual trigger resolves. So maybe if um you copy a one power creature that cares about its power, suddenly you've got plus one power, but that seems like a very niche interaction. Um you can also do this like basically if the, if there is a scenario where a creature's ETB is better as a two two, this card can do some weird stuff that Aethermans is familiar doesn't. Um but yeah, in general I would say this card is mostly gonna be a slight downgrade to familiar. Um, but maybe maybe your deck really wants more familiars and you just want like extra copies of that, so this can provide that. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a really cool card. It's got really awesome flavor text. Um, overall, I like the card a lot. I'm not sure if it'll fit into any decks, though. Yeah, I mean, I love the design. Um, I just think that it's really easy to get excited about what this does before you like think about the fact that we actually basically already have this. Which is... Yeah. ironic because i think that like that feels like a, a story slash pattern that uh, is comparable to what ha what's happening in the flavor text here <laughs> so <laughs> a little bit of irony there yeah it's, it's like a greek tragedy mm -hmm. so next up we right. have ishim's meddling um so this is by matt and not time spiraled matt who created um uh, the entirety of MS3, but the other Matt, who made Scriptures of Urshad. Um, so essentially, at its base, it's an a enchantment blood artist, uh, but oh, I guess not blood artist, because it's only creatures you control. So asymmetrical, or or uh, only blood artist for your creatures that you control. Cutthroat. Yeah, Zulaport Cutthroat, that's the one. Um, but you can also animate it to turn into a 4-4 four, 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 four angel creature with flying and vigilance. I think this also falls into um, the pile of cards which are like good and limited, uh, but not great for MSCM. Not because I think that this card is bad, and I think that in like some standards or whatever, this would be kind of a slam dunk. But because I think that like we are overloaded on powerful blood artist effects already, and this one just kind of misses the cut. Um, if anyone gets around to building an MS cube, I think this is awesome for an MS cube. Um, one other thing to note is that, uh, similar to um, from Shingen's Heart, this is a reference, like uh, most of Matt's cards actually, to existing MSC verse lore. In particular, it's a reference to one of the Myos gods. I'm pretty sure it's oh, one of the Myos okay. gods. It might be one of the angels. Mm. And also, um, I just want to quickly mention, speaking of references, we did miss earlier Paradia's Disciple as a reference to uh, the Parallel. angel. Yeah to Eralu by Simon Williamson, which is another set in uh, MSN. Oh, so it looks like Ishim is a word for oh, angel in my... Yeah, it's just it my just angel. angel. Yeah. Okay, so it's just the angels are fucking with you, is what this card's name means. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, I think that... The, the angel plays peekaboo. Now I'm an angel, now I'm an enchantment. So, honestly, I think that there is a pretty decent upside to some blood artist effects in that you can just randomly smack someone for four um, if you get up to four mana and don't have anything else to do. Um, but the fact that this isn't a creature itself means that kind of your whole death ball synergy stuff doesn't work quite as well. Like, you can't sack this imp den mother to kill them, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, I wouldn't say it's it's absolutely useless. And the fact that it is an enchantment may matter for some decks. Who knows? Um, but yeah, in general, I think that most of the current black white aristocrats decks probably don't want this okay and next up 
bow down to your overlord, finally in card form, crashing onto the MSCM uh, stage in style. It's Lackeybot, which says it says designed by Cajun, but we all know it's the other way around. So, <laughs> so it's one red and a white for three two, and whenever it deals uh, damage to a player, not combat damage. So you know, big brain stuff. You choose you choose an artifact card with converted mana cost X or less at random, where X is the amount of damage dealt, and you may create a token that's a copy of that card. And you may be like, choose, but from where? And that's the thing. You just <laughs> randomize it from the pool uh, of cards in the format. And of course, like you, you couldn't have Lackey Bot without doing some heavy duty searching. So definitely appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, this is like. This is like the ultimate meme. Um, it's not even that bad, to be honest. Uh, you expect to get around one point, like maybe two mana's worth of value from this every time you hit. Um, and, and maybe not all two mana artifacts are actually worth two mana, but like you're not getting nothing when you hit with this. So I, I'm I'm not completely willing to totally write this off. I don't know. It's just hard to say. It, it's like it's very Hearthstone. Yeah, I am not looking forward to someone high roll killing me with this. <laughs> I, I, oh wait, it's not legendary. You can get another lucky pot. You can get another life bot, which is cool, but also means it can't be a commander, which is sad. Oh, that yeah. Is I think I think like yeah. lots of people like the. I'm just gonna go out on a limb and say that it's it's not legendary because of how long the type, how big the type line would be. And I feel like lots yeah. of people would like, would like gladly yeah, like, er, yeah, would just like house rule that lackey bot. If someone wants to run lackey bot EDH, I will gladly allow them to do that at my table. Mm. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Pip's just chomping at the bit to talk about the next card. So you want to go for it? Which is the next card? Because I can't sort alphabetically. Oh yeah. I don't have MSC. It's, oh, it's, uh, it's see, Marshy Marauder. Yeah, and I was and I was oh. saying chomping at the bit because alligators they That's, got them big chompers. Yeah. Uh, so Marshy Marauder is a card I designed. Um, it's one of the three cards I designed for this set, or that got in. So we're two thirds of the way done. Um, it's green and black for two two, and whatever creature control dies, put a plus plus one counter on it. And whenever it dies, create a 1-1 one, one green inside creature token for each counter on it. Uh, also notably, it is a demon. So it is a 2-drop demon, which maybe you do some dumb stuff with Emissary um, with this. Probably not. I gotta, probably... I gotta say, this is actually really great with Emissary. Or at least, or really? okay, it's not great with Emissary, but it is, it is one of the better demons that you can play in an Emissary deck. That's you know probably I mean? fair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're talking about a profane emissary, a card from Alara, which tutors a demon to the top of your deck on e on uh, ETB. Um, no, it's whenever or... you would draw a card. Oh yeah, whenever you would draw cards. Yeah, sorry, I forgot. I forgot that it's even better than of a card than I remembered. Um, <laughs> and if you, as long as you control a demon, it gets plus two, plus two in life link, making it a four four life link for two. Um, one thing that's really interesting about this card. One that I was thinking of when I was designing is I really was trying to make it so that on its own it wasn't actively bad to include in your deck, but it really wasn't all at MSCM caliber, and you really need to start making use of as much of the card as possible. So, getting a single counter on it via a single creature dying when it dies, it drops a 1 1. That's not that great, like, it's a kind of it's a decent watch wolf. What this card starts to get insane is when you start getting a lot of creatures dying or when you start putting counters on it from other sources. And then when it dies, you make a bunch of tokens, which you can then sack for other, a lot of other value. Um, it does a weirdly delayed version of um, Young Necromancer, actually, for the sack outlet, mm. where Young Necromancer plus sack outlet means you can actually uh, effectively double the creatures you have to sacrifice, because each one then produces a token. This does the same where you sacrifice all of your creatures, get a bunch of counters on this, sacrifice it, get a bunch of tokens, sack all those tokens. Um, so you can still do, like, imp and mother combo kill turns. Yeah, and uh, I actually think this is the kind of card that I would be interested to run in, like, some kind of Theocracy deck. Um, because this plays well if you're just, like, flooding the board with creatures and bashing them in. Um, especially if you also are running some kind of sack outlet stuff. 
there are plenty of two drop creatures that let you sack stuff, like the aforementioned Inten Mother. Um, and there's also a lot of support for counters in black green, uh, such as Supplanter of Realities, that can go well with this as well. Yeah, overall, just like a solid card that fills a bunch of roles, but doesn't dominate in any one of them. And I think that's a good place for a new card entering MSEM to be. For sure. So next up, we have Paragon of Noon. Uh, this one's also designed by Cyber. Um, and this one really says like, yo, um, we heard white was bad, so we're going to help them. But unlike everyone else trying to help them, we're actually going to play to their strengths in a fun way. So it's a white uh, one drop that uh, for a white two one one drop, um, and if you get to five mana, you can make it uh, indestructible and also tutor up another one drop each time it attacks. And since it's not legendary, you can just get another Paragon of Noon and keep going. So it's basically like um, this, I think this would be a lot more interesting, obviously, if like our main anti aggro wipes weren't minus x minus x wipes. Because then this could be like cool like wipe yeah. protection that also like that it basically says like if you don't get your wipe in time, I'm gonna like I'm gonna really punish you for it. But yeah, violent collapse, singularity's grasp, vi vibrant rapture, they all kind of just hurt this card too much. Even um okay, yeah, no, yeah, they're just those three. The main thing to know is that Cyber really likes divinity counters. If if you pick up one thing about Cyber's design, um that is one thing you should like be keeping an eye on. I think this card is similarly just it's a phenomenal cube style card where it's a one drop that scales really well into the mid to late game. Um, I think in MSEM it feels a little slow for the fact that you know it's a one mana two one you want to end the game as fast as possible. The fact this isn't a dead top deck is nice, but it's it's answerable in a lot of clean and efficient ways. Um, especially if they just like res even if they have a pit bull, they just respond to the activation, and you're now down six mana. Um, but if you manage to get the swing off, like it feels really cool assembling that sort of like value engine or toolbox with a bunch of one drops. Yeah, I don't think you should be running this unless you're going to be happy with running a vanilla one mana two one some percentage of the time, um, because there yeah. are going to be plenty of games where you're running a, a deck that's probably pretty low on land count um so like you probably won't be able to actually activate this thing except in the decks where you've kind of flooded out a little bit and, and like that's nice flood insurance. insurance is good yeah. yeah cool all right uh next card the next card is um i think either tied with core charge or for the most expensive card on the bonus sheet or just the most expe expensive card on the bonus sheet it's a whopping yeah, nine charge mana uh, Phyrexian Mind Flayer, designed by Honchkrow David, and this one's a, a, a this one's a whopper of a card. So it's a homage to uh, Jin Gitaxius, um, wherein uh, essentially uh, it makes it so that each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by three, and then if a player would draw a card, that player draws seven cards instead. So just overkill city out here, and like. We could talk about the body and its keywords, but you're generally not playing it for any of those, except for Flash, which is sometimes you really just doozy someone with this by flashing it in um, right when they're about wow. to play a draw spell. And you then just be like, yeah, you today, really want to, you want to draw? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. And like, yeah, obviously, should, and honestly, like this card- around your nine open mana. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm, I'm gonna, like, I'm, this is not seeing MSC in play. If this sees MSC in play, like- It's me cheating out. Like, it's not, you, it will see a bad cheat out target. Yeah, I mean, this is a fine sheet out target. I think, I think the thing is just like, I think Chikyu Champion and Veller just feel like better. But like, I can see maybe just people doing different things. I guess. So you think... I... Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I was saying like, if you are trying to combo off, like you could, you could potentially just temp temp resist this and then like draw like. 30 cards and then win the game from there. Like, it's not that hard to win the game. If you uh, so, like, cards. you gristle brand it, I suppose. But then, like, yeah. you need to already have some way of drawing cards. And so, you need more open mana. I, I guess I could yeah, see. Or it. you just use free draw spells. Like, we do have enough. Start, like, you start by. I don't know. If your opponent has lost any life, you start by casting um, 
the one drop. Yeah. Yeah, social crisis works. Um, week from chaff is one mana draw fourteen cards, discard two. Like that probably <laughs> does most of the job, right? <laughs> you can run yeah. rituals too, right? So you can kind of, you can kind of set up some kind of weird storm deck that tries to get this into the yard, and then. The thing that the it reminds there. me of is Tinfins, which is a legacy storm deck that is built around recurring Gristlebrand, drawing a bunch of cards. And recurring a children of Corliss to draw increasingly more and more cards. Oh, I remember that deck. Yeah, this kind of does a similar thing. Yeah, I I really like this design because I think it's a smart cheat out target. It's a cheat out target where like if you want just like dumping raw stats or raw answer me or die power, we have better cheat out targets. But this serves a really unique function. Um, it's also really funny in multiples. Like, in an EDH <laughs> game, if you play this and start cloning it, your mm. opponents get very concerned very quickly. I mean, they just um, mill out, like, almost immediately, right? Yeah, they draw one card and they draw 49 cards instead. <laughs> it, either your opponents are all dead, or they, or you just won the game for the next player. So, good luck. <laughs> Godspeed. Mm. Yeah, I think... I think I'm a little bit lower on its uh, MSCM, or I guess a, a, quite a bit lower on its MSCM playability than you guys, but I think that you guys, uh, the Gristle, I guess the Gristle brand comparison helps uh, a bit to understand where you guys are coming from. But I think in yeah, MSCDH, it, this is obviously really, just a monster. It's not really much, much worse than Gristle brand because it doesn't enable itself, and it also can potentially get, like, refill your opponent a ton if you don't finish them off, and um, your opponent can draw it in speed to try to find counter magic or whatever like there's there's a bunch of ways this could go wrong but i think the raw power is definitely there and it's it's worth trying to build around yeah fair i i think that like that explanation makes a lot more sense to me because mm -hmm. when i because yeah i was just I, at first when i was like i just saw this and i was like nine mana and like i i was like thinking about our reason cheat out deck slash targets and i was like eh this requires additional support but I, I guess like the idea is like, well, that additional support turns into you can combo off again anyway, so it doesn't matter if they remove the first one. So yeah, and I also would say uh, worse than Grizzlebrand is definitely not a death. Yeah, worse than <laughs> worse than Grizzlebrand refer, is probably like ninety nine percent of Magic cards, maybe ninety eight yeah. percent if we're being generous. So uh, I I was gonna say I think it's probably closer to ninety nine point nine percent. Like there's a strong argument for Grizzlebrand is like, in the top three best creatures ever printed, assuming you never intend to cast them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright, uh, should we move on? Yep. And the Start next one Pip is the last of Pip's designs, so give, take it away. Uh, yeah, this might be my favorite of my designs. So this is Pitch Power Curse, which is red-black um, enchantment or a curse enchant player. Whenever one or more creatures attack enchanted player, uh, their controller may sacrifice a creature. If they do, Enchanted Player lose 3 life, sacrifice a non-land permanent, and discards a card. Alright, if you are still in the year 2021 registering uh, Agonizing Punishment, please stop, register Pitch Power Curse instead. I've done it, you can thank me later. Um, 4K no yeah. losos? No! <laughs> you can't run that many 2-drops that don't impact the board. Just um, trying to stop me. I probably can't. <laughs> So, like, the idea is you curve, like, I don't know, random shit or one drop into this. Uh, ideally, like, a... Menipack? Um, Menipack's decent. I think you would rather have either a recurring one drop or a one drop that creates uh, a token or tokens. Yeah, maybe it's like a Doom Traveler-esque card. Yeah. And then you sacrifice it, and realistically, it's doing way more than it would do on attack. Uh, and if you manage to do that without losing any board presence, you put your opponent in a really nasty position. Because if they had a turn one play, you just killed it. And you made them discard card. And they lost three life. And you're prepared to do it again. And I mean, is it, and if they didn't have a turn one play, it's just... Ugh. Yeah. It's, it's weird because it's actually better against people who play to the board more than the people who, like, sit behind a wall of counter magic. But for those people, it still represents a must-answer threat, because then be you being able to turn any single one of your creatures into a bolt that makes them discard a card is really scary. 
this is pretty close to a two minute lightning. Right? <sighs> like it's that's it's, a pretty sick in person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm into it. <laughs> and that's just on the first activation too. Yeah. The fact that it sticks around is one of the reasons I like it better than Agonizing Punishment, where it's not like a one shot like you spent two cards, you did the thing, and now what? It's like, okay, no, this allows you to convert any resource in the future into what is effectively a 2.5 for one. I think also another reason that you that you probably like this over Agonizing Punishment is that because it's not Torment three times where they get to choose it, here it's just a flat, you, you get one of each of the Torment modes. Yeah. So they, they can't just like m max out on damage and then drop a stand unassailable next turn or something like that. Yeah. Um, the one other thing I would note about this, in terms of like if you play with it, you don't have to sacrifice one of the attacking creatures. So it can also give one of your creatures haste, kind of, where you can play a creature out and then attack with a different creature and sacrifice the creature you just played out. Um, and if, for instance, you are repeatedly recurring um, one of our black one drops, this actually fulfills the conditions for all of them. Um, so, good luck and Godspeed. <laughs> Alright, uh, next card? And then next up we have Ruffler of Feathers. This one is another Cajun design. It's one green and a white for a, a three mana, eight, or one green and a white for an angel, a 2-2 two -two flyer, if a plus one plus one counter would be put on a creature you control, you may instead put your choice of a flying counter, vigilance counter, or a travel counter on it. I think the most attractive part of this is the fact that it's a three mana angel, but its ability is no slouch and limited either. I think um, in limited, this is kind of pog. Um, being able to, like, this just has a lot of flexibility. Um, giving your creatures permanent flying. In, especially if you're a deck that's running ways to make creatures big slash big, it's very, very powerful. Um, Vigilance and Trample are a bit more niche, but like having the option is great. Um, and this is also just a Windrake, which is, you know, total, like, on, by that by itself, that's like a fourth, fifth pick. So I think this card is definitely a slam dunk limited. Uh, MCM, don't think it gets there, but it's cool. I, yeah, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I, was, I think that's just about the evaluation of it. This does technically go infinite with permutate, like, but permutate already oh, goes infinite with permutate, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, never mind. I don't know why I said that. Yeah, never mind. Okay. So next up, we have Sir Waver the Broken Hour. Um, it's a four mana four four, um, and whenever it attacks, each opponent loses two life, and you gain that much life. So, uh, it's effectively a six four if you're trying to be like aggressive with it. When it dies or is countered, you exile it with three time counters on it, and it gains suspend. So, and I I love the flavor of that with the art, where it's like, you you can keep killing it, but uh, she'll always return. Unfortunately, in MSCM, I think uh, we have good exile removal. We have Journey's End, and four mana is a lot for a creature that doesn't impact the board. So, I feel like the place you bring this in is against. Um, you played in the board against a control deck that is looking to just be like hard control and is like, I guess, blue black. And then you're just like, haha, screw you. But then that's also very a very narrow niche. So other than that, I'm yeah. not sure where you would, where this would I see mean, play. Also, as that type of player, I'm okay just dealing with this once every three turns. Like, that's also fine. Yeah. yeah. Like, it takes a like, long time okay. before you actually grind them out with this. I can just counter it when it next comes off suspend. I can just keep doing that over and over and over again. And yeah, it's a threat that you're uh, drawing for free every three turns. But if this is your silver bullet, you can do better. Um, Agreed, it's good yeah. if it's in combination with other stuff. In limited, I have no idea how you're going to fucking beat this card. This card seems <laughs> obnoxious as fuck there. Um, yeah. The other thing uh, that I think is notable is Hersey used the wording that um, Wizards has specifically moved away from because it fucks up EDH too much, um, which is the whenever attacks each opponent loses two life and you gain that much life. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, so in the EDH table, this gains six life per swing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't think that's that big of a deal. Um, it's, it's not a big deal. It's just like that's one of the things that they stopped doing because of EDH. 
Yeah, it is uh -huh. nice so, so, that... So what we're saying uh, is, so this card is a statement which says, uh, fuck Watsy, uh, and, the, and uh, EDH isn't that important. Yeah, I, th I, I given Hersey, I would guess that the statement here is fuck EDH. <laughs> I, th I think the, the fact that you don't have to pay commander tax is something. Um, yep. But, like, I don't know. I wouldn't say this is, like, a all-star commander card. <laughs> no, it's already broken the format. It's warping it all. <laughs> Alright, uh, next card? Uh, next up we have Shrine Razor, um, which back-to-back -back Herzy designs. This is one red red for 3-2 uh, haste. Whenever you sacrifice another permanent, you put a plus one plus one counter on Shrine Razor. So, this feels a lot like... Uh, what is that one card? Uh, it's... Uh, it's... Uh, it's a... Something from War of the Spark? No, 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 no. It's a it, you played it before, Dodger. It's a Naga. It's from Kahembo Old Dawn. Oh, it's, Ruinous Naga. Ruinous Naga. Yeah. So, yeah. it feels a lot like that, except it has haste, but then it also has far less utility because it only counts your own permanence. Um, yeah. And, um, and Ruinous like, Naga having trample is a big deal too. Yeah. I don't so think like, this gets at all, to be honest. Yeah, I don't know. It, that was like the immediate comparison, and it just feels like it probably doesn't get there in MSCM as a result. But it I, is, I, yeah. I do think like maybe you could set up some kind of weird combo with this, where you play it and then stack your whole board and like four twenty no scope someone out of nowhere. But like, uh, it seems kind of a stretch. Yeah, I feel like if you had if you have enough permits to be able to sacrifice that you can four twenty no scope someone this, you can probably do the same thing with the blood artist. I don't know. Maybe you're maybe you're stacking treasures or something. I mean, it's also just a force multiplier. Like one of the core things to understand about those decks is every single blood artist effect they have in play. Every single like the fact that Amp Dam Mother inherently is kind of a blood artist <laughs> when she's sacrificing things. Like all of those things add up. The faster you can get to a point where your board state of uh, like five creatures represents twelve damage is a really big deal. Yeah, that's true. Um, I just don't know if this is the payoff you want for that, though. Yeah, I'm I'm inclined to agree. I think this is very exciting for limited. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if it showed up in MSCM because the base case is a three mana three two haste, and like you know, hey, that's decent reach. Um, yeah, but I I would be a little bit surprised if it like was good. <laughs> any archetypes? <laughs> yeah, or was good maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, right, uh, uh, before, no, wait, wait. Before we move on, just this is also okay. another uh, the flavor text and uh, oh yeah, and general flavor are also references to uh, Ch Tales of Jedi, and it's uh, uh, and it's block. Uaito and Moronai are both locations that are referenced throughout uh, the block. With uh, I think the journey to Uaito probably being one of the more uh, memorable of those. But yeah. Overall, I just wanted to point that out as another custom lore TM thing. Oh, lore? Mm-hmm. And god, I think that we're going to get the hat trick of Hersey designs, because the next one is Sigiled Bulwark. So basically when... Hersey had to sacrifice a lot of designs. Like, if you're thinking, wow, there's a lot of Hersey things here, we gave away around three to four Hersey slots to other designers. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oof. So yeah, when it enters the battlefield, you tutor up a creature and a non-creature card, um, and your opponent chooses one, and you keep the other, is basically how it works. So it basically... Well, you either get shuffled back in. One of them goes on top of your deck. No, but it gets shuffled. Oh, wait, you shuffle your library. You get shuffled. So yeah, so you get, you get to keep the one... You, your opponent basically chooses one of them for you to keep, and then you shuffle the other one away. So yeah, it's still pretty powerful in that you can just tutor up... Uh, two things with similar function and, and then be like, uh, fuck you. Um, like for removal, if you're playing this in Sulta, you can just be like, okay, here's my Ravenous Chupacabra and my Pithbolt. Which one do you want? Or like if you're trying to take out a, a non-creature permanent, you can be like, okay, yeah, here's my uh, Jade Vault Reclaimer and my Pithbolt. Fuck you. And this is also one of the thing. sickest blink targets I've seen. Yeah, this card's not so flicker. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I do think it's a little bit tragic but also really 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 fortunate that the one they choose is the one that gets shuffled in so if you prophecy one of those two cards they aren't forced to give you the other one um they do get to shuffle it back into your deck so prophecies aren't super free with this 
I think that's probably a good thing in the long run. I agree. <laughs> yeah, because I feel like there's definitely room for abuse there. Um, I mean, a generally when you it. get into factor fiction situations like this, um, you're going to be looking for ways to angle shoot and ensure you get like the effects you want no matter what. And usually the easy way to do that is like, okay, well, I just get two cards that have basically the same functionality, um, and now my opponent doesn't really have a choice. Like, they just have to give me the one that's slightly worse, but, like, still does what I want. So, like, how you said, you can get two removal spells, you can get two board wipes, you can get two, I don't know, blink effects, whatever you want. Yeah, do you overall, think you play I'm... this at all, Pip? Or does it not really fit the next MO? Um... I don't think it fits the deck as is. I think the main question yeah. is like, do you try to rebuild the deck to like use this instead of um instead of council? I'm pretty sure the answer is a very definitive no. Yeah, but, I like, agree. I I think that is technically a question you can entertain. Um, I kind of like this in Vant. Yep, seems good there. I mean, it um, literally has sigiled in the name. It's just flavor influencing you, Dodger. Look away. <laughs> I mean, so let's say you rebuild Dream Sight to be a like terrifying mid range deck. Oh, someone slaps mid-range. this on the, someone slaps this down. They show you Dream Sight well and Ancestral Council. I Dream Sight well, but you have to wait a turn. <laughs> you give them Ancestral Council. They reveal Take a Walk. Ooh, <laughs> that's. You groan because this game is now going to go on for another 50 minutes, but you're pretty <laughs> sure you're dead. You just, like, start looping Take a Walk with Archive Guardian or something? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty nuts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, should we do the next card? Yeah, so next that's up good. we have a Skypath Pilgrimage. Um, this was also another math design. Um, it's white and a blue for um, an enchantment. Aura, so it gives a creature plus one plus one flying, but the main part of it is it's basically a divination on ETB because it allows you to journey twice. So when you journey, you basically exile the cards uh, like in a journeyed pile, and whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you get to put that into your hand. So for aggressive decks, this is really good as a as basically divination plus a buff. I think in MSEM, I it's. Even even at, in that mode, I don't think it's playable, but I think in Limited, this is a straight beast. I mean, if you think you're only going to get two hits within, with a creature, this is effectively a two mana plus one plus one flying and curiosity. That's pretty decent. It also, um, it also does like allow you to potentially get those cards even if the creature that you enchanted dies, which yep. I think is also nice. So like... Your opponent has it, it. Effectively, makes every single creature you play have curiosity. Um, that, that's a good point. As long as this enters the battlefield, you are no longer vulnerable for the two for one issue with auras because it inherently gives you two cards. Yeah, as long as your opponent doesn't completely shut you out, which still might happen. Um, but I mean, in that case, it's not like a different card would have really helped you. Yeah, yeah. So I think like. I actually kind of like this for Bogle's decks because I think it's one of the better curiosity effects available. Um, now, I don't know if Bogle's really has the tools to get there, but also people haven't really tried. So, people haven't tried in a while, yeah. Yeah. And I think um, that, like, we're, we're definitely on a Pith World and Journey's End. Uh, like, I think this is probably Exent and Memento Mori's lowest point since they entered the format. So I think yeah, trying, uh, trying Bogle's again is like absolutely valid and then like set people are not playing setting sun they're playing violent collapses and sings grasp and stuff that like you can just out race if you have enough auras you can pile onto it so that's true i think there's actually a lot of points in favor of this card um i mean like i think there's points in favor of boggles but i don't know if i feel like i wish i could name them off the top of my, top of my head but i know that like when i played against boggles worlds in the past i feel like they're just better cards to use Maybe. I mean, also, the Bogles decks do want to have, like, some... Well, actually, never mind that one. Um, I think one of the things that's kind of neat about this card that comes up in this limited in particular is this card's also a flicker target. Ooh. If you take a walk, this guy path, Pilgrimage, you get another two cards. That's pretty nice. 
that is uh, a schnasty combo. Yeah. Um, I mean, this card's obviously super good and limited. <laughs> like, it's, it's, yeah, definitely a beating. Um, but especially, especially since there's also a lot of aura support. But yeah, I don't know. This is this is one of my favorites actually. Um, in the entire bonus sheet. It has a I'm bird on it. Play. I'm not surprised. <laughs> Okay, and right, also so shout out to this card for splitting up uh, what would have been a four Hersey streak because the next one is Suburban Rune Brawler. Right back to the Hersey <laughs> bonus sheet. Um, uh, Dodger, I think this card was designed for you, so maybe. Yeah, you you're legally obligated to read it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, so uh, Suburban Rune Brawler is a five mana, five four. When it enters the battlefield, you may exile an instant or a sorcery card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard. Um, and then it has landfall trigger, but only once each turn. Uh, when a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may cast a copy of the exiled card for free. So this is one of the most interesting landfall effects in the format now. Um, most of the current landfall effects that are available are pretty simple and snowball-y. You have Seeker and Sling Bloom, as well as like Into the Unknown. Those are the general ones that you play. This card, sharing a, a mana slot with Seeker is rough. So I don't think this goes into the current builds of Wonderfall, but I do think that there's some pretty interesting things you can do with this. Um, you can do like some pretty mundane things, like exiling a Rogar's Frenzy or whatever burn spell you want. Um, but there's also much more spicy things you can do, and none of, the, none of that even come to me off the top of my head. But just like you can exile Pithwilt, you can exile like I don't know Curse of the Drow. And no, walk people can't. out on their. Um, that, that is can. not a thing you can do. Oh, it costs it costs three. three okay, yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, you can you can exile some other discard spell. I can't. Do um, that, yeah. Yeah, and like lock people out on their on their draw step. Um, you can exile your far seek and go super ham on ramp. You can exile something that blinks the rune brawler, and maybe like try to chain a bunch of blink spells or something. I don't really that seems kind of troll, but like I, I just I just yeah. think that this card is very open ended and I'm definitely gonna probably try to build something around it at some point. Um so what you maybe, do is you get yeah. a time walk under it. And then every single time you hand a land drop you get time walk. Yeah, I mean if there's some kind of two mana time walk effect that's pog, but I don't think we have any. Um yeah. I know Pip's using something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really good. So honestly, I wish I could talk more about the potential options for this, but I just haven't really looked into it that much. Um, but I guess suffice it to say, this card is very exciting, and I think there's a lot of very interesting um, possibilities here. I just want to look more into it and see if, like, doing this thing is, like, if there's a reason to do it beyond just, like, oh, I'm Seeker Herpeter, you know? Yeah. yeah. If this costs four mana, I would be a lot more high on it. Or even if it costs six, but could exile something bigger, because then it would occupy a different spot on the curve. Um, but I don't know. It, it's super cool. I'm a big fan. So, oh, I just want to say this card is, uh, it's nice to see a Mega Cycle being filled out. This is clearly the red sheet. <laughs> <laughs> the red one? Um, the red chili. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a Mega Cycle of two drop creatures in two different colors that make four fours. Uh, it's even a demon, mm -hmm. although it is legendary. Um, my but my I think... contribution to the Mega Cycle is just going to be Gex of St. Trapped minus one mana. <laughs> Ah, uh, yes. Card design. 
I I think that this card is really really exciting because um there's a there's a kind of a glut of cards that uh support this like sort of self damage archetype um with this and another card on the list as well as a couple tools in Monsters of Chikyu. Um so this is going to this is going to be on one of my like one of one of the first things I'm going to be building around. And it's super easy to proc too. Like you can just do this with your lands. You can you can just uh on turn two like you say you played a plague land on turn one, just play a shock fetch, fetch up another plague land, cast this. Boom, you got a two one minutes and a four four flyer. I mean it's a lot of pressure on the board if this sticks, but I do think one thing that you need to be careful about with a lot of these paid life cards is even our control decks kind of have ludicrous reach with things like um uh Mark Arthur Salen and Glitch. So I do think we need to be a little bit careful with using our life total resource. Like, mm. yeah, you can do it really quickly, but you need to make sure that what you're doing is resilient enough that if your opponent removes your creature, you didn't give up a resource for nothing. Yeah, or maybe have a way to gain your life back efficiently. Yeah. Might be another thing. I think that's going to be the biggest problem for sure, is trying to figure out, like, okay, what are some ways I can include life gain in my black red aggro deck that don't, like, drastically reduce my clock or, or you just um, you go all in on like i'm just gonna kill them or die trying that's also I don't think fair. That's, like i get that and i get the appeal and logic and i think it's much better the more of these sorts of things are stacking on top of each other because you can double dip from the life aim but i just think it's really dangerous to because like let's say you do that and you pay your four life if they kill this before you can hit your end step you got nothing. They actually just claimed one for one you and dealt you four damage for nothing. Right. I'm so. assuming that you're playing self damaging effects that are also beneficial, but I also just think that it's like, I think at a certain point, like I think that like if you're, I I guess my logic is like if you're doing this, you might as well just do it to the quickest slash best extent. And if that's not worth doing slash not fast enough, then I feel like the deck isn't worth it. I suppose it's just my logic. <laughs> I feel like if you're, if you're, if you're taking this to an extra level where you're faffing about with life gain, unless that life gain is also somehow also good, I think that like you're putting, you're diluting like the strength of your deck. Yeah, that's why I said like it's important not to drastically reduce your clock. Um, yeah. And I, I think they're also like, like this is a great follow up to Banish Companion, for example. Um, and if you do, sure. if you do play this on turn two, it, it can be very much answer or die. And if they do spend a removal spell on this, that means that uh, if they let you get the demon, now they, they're getting hit for four in the air. And if they kill the demon, you can often just make another demon, right? So, like, I think that this is going to be a card that snowballs really well if you do manage to get that first activation. Um, but it can be a little bit risky. Yeah, Especially if you're I... playing it like, burn. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's... It procs on your end step is one of the things that's notable, so you can't you can't use this like as a defensive tool. Um, I don't know. I I think it's really important to remember just these effects are cool and they're very exciting because we do have the tools to enable them easily. Um, it just is important to remember like even if you can enable them, like just make sure you're doing it in a way that is worthwhile. Mm -hmm. All right, okay. next card. Next up is another Gateways card. It's a 10 to the Grove. So it's simple. It's a 3-mana ramp spell that makes a Mountain Forest land token, and it has Cascade. Is this the first Cascade card in MSCM? It sure is. Oh boy. That opens up <laughs> so much space. I yeah. would not be shocked if this card becomes 4-mana at some point, but uh, the MSCM council is like, yeah, let's try it. I think it's like, <laughs> at, yeah, I guess at four mana, it's just like, well, also now I also hit the three mana things. But I guess at that point, it's a fair, it's a f more of a fair card. It's harder to, like, make it so you always get a certain subset of things. Is yeah, the, yeah. Is the balance. So I think that this card is obviously pretty nuts. Um, it's not as good as something like Shardless Agent, I think. I'm. I could be wrong. I, I think this is better than Shardless Agent, but it also depends Maybe? on what kind of what you're valuing. 
like it's like it's, it's better in ramp decks, but it's not good. It's not as good in like the generic style deck, like that's just trying to play mid range. Um, but Charlotte Agent would usually appear in. So and we also don't have high roll stuff like Ancestral Vision to hit. That's true. That's true. But like, I think if you hit a so like this is a two mana effect. If you play sure. this on turn, <laughs> sorry. If you play this on turn two after you've ramped on turn one, and you hit a two drop, you've generated four mana worth of spells off a three mana thing that you play on turn two. Mm -hmm. and I think it's also you... worth noting that uh, this resolves after whatever you cascade into. So mm, hitting splitting bloom is actually the nice because you yeah. you get a, you get a. a a mana dork, and you get the three one one as well, um, all for three mana. In addition to getting a land, so this card would absolutely be disgusting if into the unknown was still two mana. Um, because the ability to get into the unknown and immediately trigger it is super gross. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm just a little all over with this card because I think. It's just good enough as is to run it in ramp decks and some like judge style decks. Like, if you remember the um, the Innistrad era mid range decks where they were playing mana dorks and like explorer or farseek to you mean like the like, wolf run ramp decks, the ones that were like playing turn three, um, Olivia Voldarin, and that was kind of just like the game plan is I'm gonna get oh. turn three Olivia Voldarin. If you so kind of like the IP. kind of like the Jun decks, but that happen to have male dorks. Yeah, I yeah, think yeah. this actually serves a really important role in those sorts of decks where it can like, yes, yeah, sometimes you're gonna hit Pith while playing male. Oh, I can't cast that because like that's how Blood Right Elf works. I actually but, think yeah, you, this probably replaces Seng Jin in like Eggs Jung deck because that deck runs yeah. seven male dorks. Um, it wants to ramp a little bit. It runs like stuff like Ruin Delver, which is great to hit. Um, yep. I guess the that problem does. is that hitting mana dorks is one of the worst things you can hit with this, unless you really want to go to six. I mean, then it's just an explosive education for three mana. Like, now well, you're at five mana. Education for three mana isn't actually that good in mid-range if your curve tops out at four. But it is good if your curve tops out at five with Xanakin. Also, yep, like, that's wait, true. Well, I mean, what mid range decks? I feel like we don't have a, even Hellion Devastator decks don't top out at four. You usually go to five, because five it's like, well, I'm referring to specifically Egg's yeah. Jundek, which... Yeah, but Egg's Jundek runs... also went up to 5 for Zhang Mao. Well, uh, Zhang Mao is 4 mana, but Earthbreaker Behemoth is... Uh, no, no, the other Zhang. I don't think, I don't think that, that card was in Egg's no. Jundek. Okay. I don't think the Intrepid was in one. Um, but, like, I, I think this card just is kind of good enough for me to be interested in it. Um... The big, the big question, like comparing this with Shardless Agent, is Shardless Agent is good if you need to play to the board. Like, that's when a 2 2 is good. This is much better than Shardless Agent if all you're trying to do is just engage in mid range wars. Where, like, mm -hmm. I'm going to hit my 5 drop faster than you, and I'm going to do it while developing the board. Like, this is great at doing that. That's true. Yeah. And also, I mean, just I, like, I, also, like, if you're yeah. playing, like, a good 2 drop in any ways, then you'll be like, okay, I'll just, like, I'm either the, I'm either committing to the board now, or I'm ramping into something that makes it so that I don't care about what your current board is. So it's just one of those things. I think what you do need to also make make sure though is that you're not running too many cards. Um, if your deck is super high on removal, then this is not that great in two matchups where there aren't a lot of creatures. Or if your deck's running like counter spells or cane dancer or whatever, this can this can miss. If you're running X spells, this can miss. So like. It's, there it's are really some deck only constraints, but it, yeah, it just play it I feel the like same in way control, you, you just play right Alfie over this. Like, I, I don't see a yeah. world where you're playing this in a deck with counter spells. So yeah, I, that, that's I see that. true. But like, also, you can. I think one of the important things to remember, um, because if like this is one of the evolutions, jump decks have is okay. Terminate is a little bit worse, but Bolt and Blightning are way better. <gasps> Wait, I know what I want to do with this. What do you want to do with this? I want to cast this with Emissary of Antiquity. Oh, that sounds gross. <laughs> really, what Emissary of Antiquity needed was to become card advantage in addition oh, to Oh, my goodness. Oh, I need, I need to do this now. It's, it's time for Big Red. It's time. Like, 
you you hit Rogar's <laughs> office, and you're just like, cool, if they have a creature, I kill it. If they don't have a creature, I deal them three, and I have Rogar's in Graveyard. And okay, I'm much is, more likely to have the mana. It to turns out the green splash is what you need for Big Red. <laughs> I mean... Let's yes. get chalky. Um, all right. <laughs> What's the next card? Next up, uh, I think this is a, a Dodger card. It's Tricked it's Out Trid. Hoverboard. So Tricked Out Hoverboard is a 2-mana red-white equipment. Um, it has equipped creature, gets plus 1, plus 0 for each artifact you control. And as long as you control 3 or more artifacts, equipped creature has flying and haste. Um, and it has equipped for 3. So my general thought with this card is I wanted it to be for um, the red-white artifact aggro shell, which was the, you know, the prompt. Um, and I think that's something that MSM has kind of been missing, is like a good cranial plating-like. Um, I think this card is sort of that. So obviously cranial plating is much more efficient because you can equip it for only one mana. But this yeah. does have the option to give your creature evasion, um, which I think is very relevant if you're trying to get your artifact echo deck to finish someone off quickly. Um, and haste is nice if you're running cheap creatures because you can play a cheap creature, give it like plus five, plus zero, and flying and haste all at once. So like this is very good with like Memnite type stuff. Um, I don't know. What do, what do you think? It's interesting because we already have two things that are very similar to cranial plating. Uh, one is Steam Damio's Gauntlets, and the other one is uh, Masua's Edge. I think is what it's called. Something okay, like that. I know about the Gauntlets. I haven't I haven't heard of it before. It uh, scales the number of colorless creatures you control. So not quite. Oh yeah, it's I more. remember that card now. Yeah, but this card's just it's interesting. I think it's ludicrously powerful if you can get over the mana hoop and if you can produce both red and white mana. The main issue is both those things are a non-zero factor and the mana investment involved in this is so much more painful if your opponent is interacting. Right. Like, yeah. um, I do think the fact that this card is vulnerable to like all of our playable removal is a little bit worrisome. Um, but, you know, at the same time, like you can just punk people out of nowhere. Like, they can think that they've stabilized, and then you play and equip this on a 1-1, one -one and their entire board state is invalidated if they take, like, 6 out of nowhere. Maybe you so. use this with Armored Flunky. Huh. Because you can that, immediately just equip it. Yeah, that makes me higher on this card. Um, I don't know. I, th yeah, I, think, I, was actually, I, was, I, I was actually just about to say, like, man, wouldn't it be sick if the if when this enters the battlefield, if you control 3 or more artifacts and just attach it to a creature you control, something like that. I do think that the as long as you control three or more artifacts is kind of flavor text because like you you have three or more artifacts. It's yeah. it's a fucking <laughs> artifact. You're have, gonna have two artifacts in play. But the three or more artifacts, is so it, not every limited deck can just jam it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I think this is a card that's definitely more exciting and limited than constructed. But I I would be shocked if no one tried it to some extent, some degree of success in constructed. I'm gonna try it. I think it, I think it can get there personally, but um, I am also a little biased, so we'll see. <laughs> cool. Uh, next card. Next up, we have Turin Study, in what I think is probably um, <laughs> probably the least intuitive card on its face, because it has two very wordy and unintuitive mechanics on it, but they but. If you have an understanding of them, it makes for a very sick design overall. So this design is by Gateways, and the flavor reference is it references Jessica Turin, who is a character from Discoveries of Akivia by our very own Pipsqueak here. So it's a two-mana enchantment that you make a... It is Archive 5, so you make a, another library with five cards in it from the top five cards of your library when it enters the battlefield. It also has Eureka, which means that it has, uh, at the beginning of your end step, if you cast a spell this turn, you get a counter. Uh, and then if you have eight or more research counters, you remove them all and you create a masterpiece token. And the masterpieces are defined elsewhere, but they're basically just powerful artifacts with their own uh, things going on. The important thing is when you achieve a uh, Eureka or masterpiece, you get to free cast everything in the, ex in the uh, second library. So splashy explosive effect that combines... Okay, you know what deck this goes in? Uh, it goes in decks? Okay. It's Chunkhorn. 
Oh god, of course it's Chonkord. It just Wild Lightning copies 5 through 8. And this card actually is really sick with Wild Lightning. Yeah, um, honestly, now that I'm thinking about it, like... Yeah, if you... Cheap, the cheap Eureka is, is good, and then you just kind of get to dome people out of nowhere. Yeah, okay. If, if you play uh, against, I don't, I don't, um, I don't, I don't look oh, forward to this being playable, though, because it's a card I appreciate a lot, but not a card <laughs> I look forward to explaining to anyone ever. You know what I mean? True. Yeah, and, like, you can definitely high roll people with this. Like, sometimes they'll just randomly exile, like, two Seismic Colossuses or whatever else, like, whatever else your high roll finisher is and just, like, absolutely one-shot someone. Um, because you can actually get this off fairly quickly if you ever play it against the blue-red Eureka deck. If that deck gets multiple copies of Eureka in play, it can be done in, like, three turns. And that's just from them playing cards like Opt and whatever other, you know, small cantrip. Yeah, Eureka's easier to achieve than it looks. The main issue with Twin Study is it's not doing anything other than enabling Eureka. Um, and I do think you have to accept the fact that it's two mana not impacting the board. I think it's also a little bit unfortunate that it it's just five cards and any of your frivolous like leading a couple lands. I don't think two mana have a Eureka and once you create a masterpiece, which is usually a point where you're winning anyway, you also get to cast like a couple spells for free. I don't think it's that good, but I do think if you start adding other sources of synergy, like ways of putting cards into this, it starts getting really nutty. So I think what's nice is that um, you actually don't need to play this on turn and have it scale. You can play like your turn two Bob Lightning or your Avid Researcher or whatever, and then like do your Eureka plan, and then draw this on turn five, you can just play it Eureka and immediately cast five spells for free. Yep. That's pretty um, So like I think that's that's pretty sick. Um if this was a card where you had like where it just it gained counters and you had to like you had to just have it sit on the board for five turns, like that's a lot less appealing. Um but I think like in decks with other Eureka effects, this card actually kind of pops off. Yeah. Okay, so next oh, up, we're in oh yeah. yeah. So next up, we have Weaver Mists, which is one blue blue for okay, an O two, huh? Do you say something? Nope. Never mind. Sorry, I thought I heard something. My bad. Uh, it's three mana though, not not two mana. Oh, okay. My bad. I, if I said yeah. two mana, my bad. It's three <laughs> mana for uh, an O two, but when it enters the battlefield, you substantiate a card in your graveyard, which is basically um. It's a similar to manifesting it, except it does the opposite, where you can cast it if it's not a creature. Um, and it also cheapens spells that uh, that you don't cast from your hand, which naturally makes uh, substantiating it uh, uh, much easier. So overall, though, I think that, like, again, I talked about how three mana is like an awkward point on the curve. So you really need to be doing something with that second clause to make this worthwhile. And I can't think of what that would be to... It's like it's not bad as like a two four for three technically, but yeah, I'm just trying to think about like what is what are you using this for? And I'm drawing a blank. I mean, it's a kind of fucked up archaeomancer. Yeah, it's basically a better archaeomancer in most like respects. You, you cast the take walk that you had underneath it for one blue, um, and then, then you blue this. And then yeah. you get a different thing back, and then you cast another thing, and then this brings back the take a walk that you cast again for one blue. Um, you, you can cheapen any flashback costs, obviously. Um, I don't know. I think I think the thing you need to look at it is just say, ignore the second ability. Is this good enough on its own? And the answer is probably. Yeah, but, I agree. Um, one weird thing you can do is this can instantly recur any one mana artifact. Yeah, that's true. Um, that's actually I'm not relevant, sure if yeah. there's a loop possible with that or what. It doesn't. It doesn't recur the artifact's ETB. So maybe if, yes, like if does. we get some kind of because oh, you're because oh, no, you cast it, it. No, right. it, you don't yeah. you don't turn it face up. Okay, yeah. I was about to say Phyrexian Dreadnought, but that doesn't work. <laughs> oh man, that'd be that'd be such a cool. There's like multiple reasons that doesn't work. Oh, that's right. You can't do it if it's a creature either. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but like, I I love me some Frontier Dreadnought enabling bullshit. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I actually think this card is just good. It's a really good blink target. Um, it's uh, it's a slightly discounted Archaeomancer. Um, also, just playing this as a as two bodies is not bad. Like if you if you play this and trade the two two off, and then either trump block with this or blink it or whatever, like that's not bad value. I think yeah, could, you the Archaeomancer it. comparison makes me a little bit higher on it than I was uh, in it before. It's like, hey, do you want an Archaeomancer based on literally any non-creature? It's one mana less, and it makes the thing one less mana t to use. And it also gives you, like, a board presence. <laughs> yeah, board presence. In the meantime, you also can, like, pop off somehow. I don't know. You have Kefthor's Will going and a bunch of one mana artifacts in your graveyard. Pog. <laughs> Funniest way to ever kill yourself that I heard. No, no, you just you also have your uh, fucking investment returns return. in play. Mm, no, okay. no, get out of here with your investment returns. Out of here, <laughs> done. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it one of these days, and you're gonna be sorry. You, you are going to do it, and I will be sorry. You also probably will be sorry. Both of us will be very <laughs> sorry. I'll be sorry I pushed you this far. You'll be sorry that you registered it. <laughs> Everyone's unhappy. Yeah, a card that right, makes uh, card? everybody happy is Wild Life Scale. We referenced uh, Dravos Argentium before, and as this is signature, uh, this uh, card has Proliferate on it. Um, so this is actually a very simple but very exciting design, I think, um, because like proliferating on every attack is pretty crazy, and if you haste this out, you can actually do stuff like. Um, hey, this is a creature which can substitute for Kati in flipping uh, the in flipping the starters from Mon on on turn three and stuff like that. So yeah, I love how this has two very um, grokable play patterns. It's like you can either play this as a three three that buffs itself um, if you don't have anything you want to buff right away, or you can just immediately get the goodness flowing right away at the cost of being able to buff itself and like that's a very easy fun play pattern to appreciate i think it it takes advantage of how fun the riot mechanic is by itself but um yeah overall i think this is a nice addition for green x plus and plus one counter aggro decks and probably nothing else yeah i agree with all that it's a pretty maybe maybe you use this with planeswalkers or something, or you use it to grow tradition fast, or I don't know something weird like I, that. I, I, no, I think it's like what you said initially was correct. This is for green X like, plus on plus on counters aggro, and if you're trying to do something else with it, it probably won't won't work out as well. I would recommend yeah. inkwell daggers instead. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. So next up is the last card in our community submitted uh, portion of the bonus sheet, and it's wish to see. So we're going to end off on a Hersey card, as is their right. Um, it's two blue and a black for a sorcery. Cast a copy of target creature or revelation card in your graveyard without paying its mana cost. And if it's a revelation, it enters as a creature. And then you exile wish to see. So if you're wondering what a revelation is, they're basically uh, uh, cards with, at this point, the only mechanic that brings them back is coalesce. But they're basically sorceries, which can become creatures uh, through various means, or through one mean, which is them being coalesced back, because you uh, essentially flash them back as a sorcery, and then they resolve as a creature. So this basically just gives you the creature part, uh, part of it. Um, so kind of flavorful and cool card. Um, casting a creature from your graveyard means that you get cast triggers, which could be relevant for... Um, it, it is... For, yeah, oh, okay, we, we, this set. yeah, I was about to... We this, like, this but in, in, in the future, in the future, if there's some relevant... Yeah, uh, if someone balanced something off of it yeah. being a cast like, trigger. Literally, I said that, and then I had a flashback to, wait, we've already discussed this at some point. I know because Pip mentioned it, but yeah. Um, if you close your eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what I do like about this is that it's actually... It's a reanimation spell that's very, very flexible. Um, and it's only one more mana than the most commonly run reanimation spell, um, Temporal Resuscitation. So if you're a kind of like tap out-ish control deck that is running something like Recall Forgotten Eons, this curves very well after B. 
Um, but you can also run this as like a flexible reanimation spell that maybe can allow you to recur whatever instant or sorcery that you might need in a pinch. Yeah, you definitely need to be like, you need to be running a good density of revelations for this to be worth it, because otherwise I think you just run Dredgecape's chant instead, basically. Well, I don't think that's true, because um, I think there are, there are scenarios where, like, maybe you're... Well, I'm saying if, like, if, you, have, like, two, if you have two or three revelations, attitude. then I don't think that this is worth it. If, you're, if, you're, if you have, like, four, four to five or, like, four to six, then it's like, oh, okay, cool. Well, like, I don't think, I think there's, there's value in this being able to, like, a violent collapse against X or, um, do I don't know, you say recur. violent collapse? Yeah. It doesn't do that. Wait, did I, did yeah. I read this wrong? You read it wrong. Yeah, oh, okay, I read this revelation. wrong. I thought I, I thought I could say creature or something. No, this okay. would be really good if I could do that. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's, that's my bad. Um, yeah, this only hitting creatures or revelations is a lot narrow. It is, it is nice to get, uh, recall forgotten eons with this stuff. Yeah, getting recall like if you forgot an Aeons is kind of fucked up. It's 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 honestly really fucked up. I'm not gonna lie. This this also might allow you to do some fun stuff with like some of the more expensive revelations that generally don't see play just because of their ex absurd mana costs. Because like some of those revelations do a lot when they're on the board. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you can also like, just might... like, bounce all of someone's stuff by like yeah. looting away. Yeah, you uh, loot away each other moral conveyances, and then you get a hexproof threat. Like that seems pretty solid to me. Um, you steal one of their lands, and then you steal one of their lands again. Yeah, for real. Like I don't know, this card seems pretty decent if you're trying to do revelation stuff. Also, can't remember if I said this, but there is currently one relevant trigger in the format, um, which is Imperial Titan. Ah, uh, and this does work cool. like that. Cool. I, right. I think like Imperial Titan hasn't seen play for a hot sex, but it's still a powerful card to keep to be aware yeah. of. Okay, so next up we're gonna be starting off on the section of the bonus sheet, which is cards that uh cards from sets that were rejected earlier in this year. So each rejected set got one card into the format. And the first set is Zoltan Postmodern by Chumbek. Probably I think it, I don't think it's a stretch to call it the most exciting set submitted to MSEM this year. Though it, um, and I think that making this decision of what to include was probably very difficult for the council, but they settled on Alien Visitor, which is Jund for a 5-1. Lethal damage is, dealt, is basically determined by their power rather than their toughness. So while it looks like a 5-1, it's actually a 3-mana 5-5. Five, five. Um, this card's kind of fucked up. It's like a door in the siege tower that also messes with your opponent's creatures. Um, I think it usually is going to buff most of the creatures that see play because MSEM is understood generally smart enough to make two ones and three twos. But there's going to be a couple of creatures that get shrunk by this. Things like bitter duckling, which we'll talk about later. I like Sparkle this with protector. Uh, I like this with the potential to make like one mana three ones, like um, Schengen Renegade and stuff. Yeah. Um, this seems like it seems like there's a lot of like kind of hidden synergies you can find with cards that are decent but haven't really found a home. Um, and I like that this kind of gives you. I I, I really like the Dora and the Siege Tower comparison because it does let you look at a lot of those kind of underplayed creatures in a new light. It also is really worth considering that um, you can play turn two off a mana dork, like going turn one door turn two five five. Puts your opponent on uh, under a lot of immediate pressure, and that sort of stat monster isn't something we've seen a lot. Uh, the other creature I'd be really interested in running alongside of this, even though it's like a really, really bad individual creature, is Lonely Devil, which is one red for a 3 1 with menace and it can't oh, yeah. or block alone. Um, so that plus this is going to beat the crap out of some people. Wait, so my question is do zero power creatures automatically die when they do not. play? Okay, but they, they die do. to. They die to Any just damage. one damage. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Because that would be kind of awkward if your mana static automatically died when you played this. Correct. That is not how it works. Yeah. Um, okay. It would and also I'll, be fucked up if you yeah. played it and just immediately killed all their mana sets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so to clarify, um, this is very similar to Zolortha, which is a canon card, but this was, I believe, designed like right before uh, that came it was... out. 
yeah, as far as we can tell, it was parallel designed, which is fucking phenomenal. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, the fact that you can say that, hey, there's a card that uh, is, was parallel designed with uh, Zoltan Postmodern and Canon is, uh, is really a sentence. And if you don't understand <laughs> that, go check out Zoltan Postmodern on Plane Sculptors. Treat yourself. Um, um, I think my favorite thing to do is curve Alien Visitor into two Cold Heart Explorers. Oh, that's actually really fucked up. Oh, that's so disgusting. No, <laughs> shut up. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that like, like this does this shuts off. Um, what do you call it? Oh my god, I forgot. Chaldron's Rage, but other wipes sure. still work well. Yeah. Other like it doesn't. Mind. It doesn't uh, turn off Final Class or or, or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so our next card is Saigura Mao Wanderer. This uh, card is from uh, Yakuzima, God of Nature, a set by Haunch Crow David. Um, and man, this card is kind of fucked up, in, but like in a fun way. Um, so it's a 4-5 haste for uh, Mardu and a 1. And you can sacrifice a creature to put a minus 1, minus 1 counter on another, on another target creature. When that creature dies this turn, you gain 2 life and draw a card. So like you can if you have like a two toughness creature you can like sack two creatures to gain two life and draw a card. If you have a bunch of creatures you can just like machine gun down your something that your opponent has and like draw cards while doing it. Um, four or five haste is also pretty good aggressive stat line. So like I think I, this this is like a pretty crazy card for aristocrats. Being four mana obviously hurts it because the more expensive you go in an aggressive deck the less the the more impactful the card has to be. It's also just like a really fun slash fucked up commander. Wait, so my question is, if you target one creature multiple Yes. Do you draw multiple exactly. cards when it dies? You do. You draw one card per creature you sacrifice. So that's kind of pog. Like, you can... Yeah. So it's yeah. Wait, I didn't even realize it worked that way. So if you sack a bunch to kill a creature, you just draw three, gain six? Yep. Yeah. Oh my <laughs> god. Um, you can also like, just do it like if they're about to kill one of your creatures... You can sacrifice that creature, or you can sacrifice a different creature to like draw a card immediately when your other creature dies. Yeah, um, this is can, a like, this is a up. really really fucked up card, but like in a way that is that in, in a way that excites me instead of revolts me. Or you can it's... you can sack creature to target their creature and then just cast a removal spell on it, so oh, it can yeah. like let you just turn all your creatures into sacks when you do cast a removal spell. When you think about it, it's like it's it's only like this in the most like vague sense of the phrase but if you squint there's some skull clamp qualities to this and that's terrifying yeah um uh, i think that it's actually fairly similar in some ways to yogmoth from yeah um and the combos you can do with this are kind of similar i would say yeah um, i yeah i mean i unfortunately the set that we had in the format that had undying has been removed uh, or now it has revive instead so you no longer can do undying combos with this, which is a little unfortunate. Um, I think that's probably a good thing. I don't yeah. really want the easy to do infinite combos. Like, I don't love that aspect of of canon modern. So you want people to work for it. Yeah, I'd rather you need like at least three. Um, so the other big thing I would note about this card is I totally didn't realize it was a four mana four five haste. And that, yeah, that's like, also changed like a lot of my opinions. Very like, valid. The thing that you were saying, Kai, about, like, oh, as it gets more expensive, it becomes harder, that really only applies for cards that are only providing, like, the engine shit. This card's providing engine shit while also just breaking your opponent. Like, this can come down, like, effectively force blocks via sacrificing creatures to kill your opponent's blockers, and then just, like, run in and kick their shit out of them. It also um, dodges no. almost all non-white removal. Yeah, the fact that it's a 4-drop, uh, it's multicolor, so good, like, countering it. Um, it has five toughness. You Does it get countered by either creatures. Cursor Glance or yeah. Destructive Ambition? Yeah. 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 So this it's is also the... a legendary creature which dodges something that I can't remember right now. Uh, I don't know either. Yeah, no clue. Yeah. Cast down, but that's not in the format. Yeah, that's not in the format. I don't know what I'm thinking. Of. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're thinking of Obfuscate from the upcoming set Tales of the Night, but um, <laughs> it gets killed by. Every single um, planeswalker that kills things, though, so a little bit unfortunate. It does um, Zen. But Zen also, Zen, Zen doesn't can kill, kill it. it. It can even sack itself too. Like that's true. You can still sack it to like draw a card, maybe. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, let's get to the next one. As much as I like Sigurd Mao. Yeah, basically Sigurd Mao. Good, play him. 
So next up we have Guard of Cuirassiers. I think that's how you pronounce that, I'm not sure. Um, which is one white white for a uh, uh, three three flying angel soldier. Each spell costs two more to cast except during its controller's turn. So a decently statted or like a good a well statted uh, hate bear that also is happens to be an angel and triggers all of the synergies that are kind of dormant in the format for that. Like I think that like I don't know that the bonus sheet gets there, but it I think it's like t right it, it takes it from like kind of a meme to like tipping on the edge of angel synergy being like uh, a legitimate and powerful strategy in its own right. We also so. Have a bit of good soldier synergies already in the format mm -hmm. um so i would look to that i don't know i think this card is a little bit weird because the the tax i don't think is actually that good like you could just be getting a silent arbiter but or not silent arbiter um the white white uh two two but the fact that it's still a three three like it's on curve flying body with relevant types and this other upside just like it's kind of a lot of the little things that push it over the top. Yeah, um, it's also playable in Lone Survivor decks if you want to index heavily on these kind of taxes. Say someone's say like there's a lot of people playing Rainbow Road or something like that. Um, I think that that's another good option, and this is something that you should keep in mind for sideboards as well because, like, this does ho hose uh, decks that operate only in some speed very hard. From having, not played, like very, from, from having but... played a, a decent amount of decks that operate only at instant speed, or like, I feel like those decks get hosed by a decent amount of other stuff as well. That's like, true, yeah. I think they hose themselves also by like not playing some of the best cards that like Control could be doing. But like, they also <laughs> get hosed by like, yeah, there's, there's a... I think that like if you're looking to this to be the hoser for those, I think it's it's like get in line. Maybe maybe you don't like need it to win against those decks. Is what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. It's so good, fair. but like, it's. I don't think that it's like. I don't think it's. It's gonna like carve out a completely unique niche in that regard. Yeah, I, I think it's like an interesting role player that might show up uh, in some pretty specific scenarios. Okay, so next up we have doop doop, doop Zolde High King's Castle. Oh, and also I forgot to mention for the previous one, uh, that card is from Pampas of Aiken, which was uh, also by uh, Chumbek, uh, the same designer as uh, Zoltan Postmodern. So now moving on to Zolde Hiking's Castle. This is uh, from Night Terrors by uh, Chartate101, um, which is a rarity list set, which uh, basically is centered around an eldritch uh, world filled with these horrifying uh, demon creatures which kind of determine the way of life on that plane. So, but getting back to the humans that uh, valiantly fight against those eldritch horrors, we, uh, Zolde is, I guess, the king of the humans. So whenever you cast a legendary spell, create a 1-1 white human creature token. And then for Wooburg, you search your library for a legendary card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and shuffle your library. The next legendary spell you cast this turn costs Wooburg less to cast, and it doesn't just reduce colored costs, it reduces all costs. So, kind of fucked up. I don't know, I like, I don't know how to evaluate this card, but it just, every time I think about it, I'm just like, well, this is obviously insane in EDH, and then in MSCM, I'm like, I don't know, like, it. it's hard to achieve, it's a little bit wacky, but then, like, if you if it gets going, it gets going. Yeah, it's... A really good it's a really powerful tutor consistency piece the main thing is you need to hit three mana then five mana um i think if you're doing that this is a really good way to grind people out like just repeatedly tutoring up planeswalkers and cast them and getting one ones in the process is just a really good way of spending all of your mana every turn uh, this means you never draw not gas you uh, can also um you can also cast those cards for free as long as they don't have a pip of any color. No, you can um, cast them even if they do. Or like. Well, like you cast them for free is what I'm saying. Well, no, that's the point. Is this reduces generic mana so small? They're not double pipped. You yeah, that's what I just said. As long as they're not double. Okay, pipped. sorry, I missed yeah. you. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, but like, you know, if you have a card that's like grab... three RD, you can cast that for free too. Yeah, you can grab yeah. your uh, rain sigh and just cast them. Like. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you can't get free Xanagan, unfortunately. Correct. You still need to pay a single black mana for Xanagan. Plus the <laughs> you already paid. Yeah. I don't know. I, th- I think this card is just, it's a cool go for the top engine. It doesn't do anything on its own, which is a little bit awkward. Um, and you really need to justify this degree of going over the top in MSEM. But, like, I wouldn't be shocked if it's saw play. Yeah, and obviously, slam dunk EDH card for five color. Yeah. All right, next card. So, next up, we have uh, Eternal Blessings. This card is from Forgotten Shadows by Nas Smith. And I think this is. This is like a very like solid past unresolved variant. I think not past unresolved. Sorry. Um, While the streams past seasons, seasons past. past. That's the one. Um, and notably, it says different mana costs and not different converted mana costs, which I think drastically increases the stock. Everyone of this card. misread. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember I pointed it out, and Herzi was like, "What?" And I was like, "Herzi, you voted on this card." <laughs> yeah. Literally. None of us except for Cajun apparently could read it correctly. <laughs> um, which means that this always grabs Pith Wilt at like no cost to the rest of your picks because nothing else has Pith Wilt's mana cost. Um, I don't know. I think it's a card you really need to say I am interested in a four mana restock that's, you know, sorcery speed, obviously, before this looks interesting. If you are that sort of deck, though, I think this card's insanely powerful because four mana restock is a is the base case, and it's a solid base case. And then once you start getting the late game, and you cast this for, like, X equals 4, and you draw the 4 best cards from your graveyard, it's really hard to imagine ways you lose from that. <laughs> it scales um, super hard. Like, you're getting an extra regrowth for every 1 mana. Yeah. yeah. While this dream starts, I, I can't wait to 1 regrowth for 2. I can't wait to cast this off Heart of Zadina for, like, X equals 10 and just grab my entire graveyard. Because I, <laughs> because I built around this card. Yeah, I mean, this is, like, one of the better things you can do with Heart of Zadina if you decide you don't want to just randomly win the game. Um, but, like, why not have both of those cards in your deck? Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. so sometimes sometimes you want to randomly win the game, but uh, you, like, it's an early game, you have Whisper of Zambush, and you need to, like, grab a removal spell or, or a wipe at that point. And then you're like, yeah, you, you can always, true. you can whisper with Amish it back later, but why do that when you could uh, re regrowth it and then also rebuy like six other cards? Yeah. Um, also, this the set this is from is called Forgotten Shadows. So I know uh, you might have mentioned that. I actually forgot. Sorry. I did mention that. It's getting um, late. Also, it I does. do one thing that makes this um, uh, also attractive to me is that it's CMC two, which means that it's tutorable with Ancestral Council for if you ever Ooh. need that. That's kind of neat. I could see this as like a one or two up in a Dream Sight like deck, just because yeah. Dream Sight is a tap out control deck usually, and being able to rebuy again Dream Sight well has a very unique mana cost. Um, so I don't know. It seems powerful. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. So next up we have Forbidden Treasure, um, and Chumbek is kind of cleaning up this list. This is from Iken, also by Ch- also by them. Um, so this is one on a blue for counter target instant or sorcery spell, and then you essentially um, surgical extraction uh, that de- uh, them for that card. Except if when cards are exiled from their hand that way, they get to uh, they they get reimbursed by drawing a card. So yeah, this is kind of uh, a, like this is kind of fucked up versus like a spell based combo. Um, People are gonna register this way more than they should though. Yeah, that's like, definitely fair. Yeah. Like, like, cause, like, cause, like, I think that, like, if there is not a, if there's not a spell based, like, a, a decent glut of spell based combo running around, then like, why are you running this? Over? Like, cause I, th- I feel like Pot Blossom is narrow, but like, it's better than it's. It's like if you're looking for like an instant slash sorcery hoser, you play that before you play this, and then no, you like, very... then you go to still the Pandemonium, and then like, yeah. This is very nice against decks that are kind of like ad nauseum style, where they have like their that wins. You know, yeah. like, um, for instance, if Casino Scam was like a highly played deck, this is a good answer to that. Um, I do think that the fact that it doesn't actually ever uh, get you card advantage because it, it replaces the cards it takes from their hand is something that's going to make it worse than Steal the Tomb in some aspects. But 
you know, it's also nice that it can just be a negate in a lot of matchups, where, where like, negate is already a, a totally reasonable card to play. Um, and if you just randomly, like, take out some of their key pieces, like, assuming you don't need to counter artifacts or enchantments or planeswalkers, this is just going to be a better... <sighs> I think I think assuming that you that's, that you that's don't have to such... counter planeswalkers is very is very dubious. That's like, true. That's I mean, true. like you you don't know that, but like I think there are metas where including this over negate could be a good uh, a good meta call. But then I, I feel like most most decade. of the time, like if you're playing this versus like okay, let's say that like there's a meta where like uh, control decks with uh, with like uh, some sort of instant slash sorcery win con are running around. Why am I running this over Thought Blossom? I think that's just my question. Well, this isn't this isn't for against control. This is for against combo. Oh yeah, against co against combo, sure. But then yeah, control but then, can like, still be you through, but yeah, many but combo then, decks. Like, can't. I, mean, I guess we it's like just don't have we don't have spell based combo decks where they need to resolve. They like don't have any redundancy. Like casino scam is the only one, and even that it's still a ability deck. Like if you board in a bunch of cards like this, and then you can't counter their ability when they play it. You're you're dead. You lose that game. Yeah, so, I guess that my point is that there's a potential future where this is true, but it's probably it's, not super true right now. I just don't want people to register this right now because I think this is a major <laughs> trap card right now. Like I just I think fundamentally this is not an effect that lines well into MSCM. It, this is a card that would be really interesting in a lot of different canon formats, um, but it's too narrow for MSCM. And negate is too good at answering every single fair deck at this point. Um, like every mm. single fair deck has some engine going on that negate hits that this just completely misses. Sure, I bet it. Mm. Okay, so next All up right. we have a card that uh, I'm going to leave to Dodger to talk about. Sure. Yeah. So this is uh, a card that I designed. Um, it's from Cloudscape, uh, which is that that I submitted. Um, it's called Bitter Duckling. It's a 2-mana, 1-3, blue-black creature. Um, at the beginning of your end step, you mill two cards. And then if there are 10 or more cards in your graveyard, you transform it into Nightsong Swan, which is a 3-3 with flying. And it has an, an upkeep trigger where you mill 7 cards, and then you may cast any card from your graveyard um, for its cost. Um, if you cast an instant or sorcery card, you exile it after it resolves or doesn't resolve. Um, it, and then it also has a lab manifest. So if you would draw a card like a library is dead, it's dead. So this is a lot of power for a two drop. Um, it's mostly loaded into the back end because the front end is kind of just a two mana one three. Um, doesn't really do anything. So you have to be a deck that can uh, flip this pretty quickly. It still does you know work for itself, but um, if you just rely on this to flip itself, it's probably going to take several turns. Um, but I think there is a lot of sweet value here. You can use this as like a Delverish threat. You can use it as a blocker for control. That can also be a finisher. You can go all in on trying to mill out and draw your whole library um, and use this as your win condition with the lab man effect. There's a lot of neat things you can do with this in a lot of different kind of decks. I, yeah, like mechanically, it's obviously very sick, but I like the. Like for me, like I, I love like the intersection of like uh, flavor and mechanics here, where it's like not everyone fits in, not everyone has to, and it has like an all to win con. So it's like screw y'all trying to win with damage and like hit ticking down life totals. I'm gonna win by milling myself. So yeah, so I will say that design wise, um, I really wanted to. So Cloudscape is a set that has a lot of burn tropes, um, and I really wanted an an ugly duckling card, but something I decided to do was kind of. I played around with the idea of it transforming into a swan, um, and it was originally a, a blue-white card that would like gain you life or something. I can't remember. But I decided to have it be a little bit of a twist, where instead of learning to overcome its kind of emo phase, it actually embraces that and uh, turns into like this goth swan in all its glory um, and actually embraces the milling that represents sadness to that like it. that like common trope with the twist thing it, it like reminds me a lot of like a pokemon i could totally see this as like a pokemon for like 100 <laughs> percent. i yeah. i think i speak for a lot of people when i say just i love the flavor text and just like everything it represents 
Basically. Yeah. Um, I think for anyone who feels like they don't fit in in a certain group or whatever, like this card should resonate with them in some on some level. It does for me. Yeah, too. I, I often don't feel like I fit in in this group, so I definitely don't <laughs> like this card. What? Uh, bad magic I'm players. Sure I'm sure you'll win a GP one day, Kai. <laughs> oh, <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> I'm, I'm ending the review early. This is fuckers. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. This is a card that's really special to me. Um, it's also my first card that will be in the format. I know I have a couple other cards from the bonus sheet, but I'm re I really hope this card sees play. Um, I think the power is definitely there. But, it's a very yeah. powerful card, so I'm just going to say right here, like, yeah, this is the card I'm going to use in my first GP winning deck, and I can't wait to champion promo it. I'm going to get some really sick art. It's going to be like... Uh, <laughs> Are you like, running Ike and Black back? Um, honestly, not a bad idea, but not like, but like without the Ike <laughs> and with, and like with an additional color. But yeah, that's, with that is actually, combo. that's actually a kind of deck, that's a, that's a kind of deck that I would like to run this in, and I just completely forgot about. So yeah. I have a bitter duckling deck uh, that I sent to draw those. If you also want to peek, so I would, 100%. I would uh, probably be playing this with uh, scuttling Nat and Inish two as like my threats of choice, and then kind of run a mid range style deck that can also play a tempo game plan. Maybe mm -hmm. that's, that's where cool. I would probably run this. Um, in testing, I mostly use it as a control wing, yeah, but I... there there are a lot of different things you can do with it. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, I was gonna say like <laughs> card this, card good. Uh... Yeah. So next up yeah, is cards. Eldritch Emergence from Whispers of Basula, um, which is a set by El Makino. So this is a board wipe for three black and a black. Destroy all non-horror creatures. You may cast a spell as though it had flash if you control a horror creature. I think being a five mana wipe just kind of... Five mana creature wipe that doesn't even hit revelations. Um, I think that like this isn't playable in MSEM, unless I'm missing something. I think the fact that it's an instant speed wipe if you have a revelation or if you have a horror out already is kind of interesting to me. I'm not sure what the actual base of horrors is beyond revelations, so we have a couple of pushed ones. Um, my old dogs, the knight from Love Song, is a good example because that's also yeah. like a horror tribal card. Yeah, um, I think this card, if it's good, it will be in like some horror mid range deck where you play to the board with a bunch of horrors, and this is a plague wind rather than an actual board wipe. And some instant speak plague wind. Um, I don't think this is gonna like gonna change the format in any way. I don't think this is good outside of the one niche. But I think it's another card to put into the pile of cards that make you want to play for a tribal. And eventually, we'll hit enough that it's worth it. Yeah, it's a fun build around for sure. Okay, and next up we have uh, decide boundaries. This is from Search for Understanding, which is a set by Cyber Chronometer. It's one and a white for an instant. Um, if, a, if an opponent controls more lands than you, search your library for a planes card. If an opponent controls more creatures than you, you get a creature card with convert mana cost two or less. So being an instant speed two mana double tutor is pretty attractive. Now, but the question is like, are you? Is it like worth playing this card for? You have to like be tutoring something. Like you have to have like relevant targets in your deck to tutor, tutor for. So probably like some sort of like hate bearsy deck or like um, something. Yeah, I think probably like a hate bearsy deck is the one that's most likely to play this. Um, I actually kind of like this in an Abzan mid range ish deck. And I think like the problem is like so many one. so many good creatures there are on three, which is what makes me hesitate for mid range. But yeah. I don't want this in hate bears because I play to the board more than my opponent. I want this in a deck where I don't need to start the game by playing to the board is i think the logic that yeah it's really a, a, you can tutor up a bitter duckling if you're in an esper bitter duckling list um you can find non basic planes for this um, yeah you can find the, uh chili inish to sack bowl sport flow stuff like that okay, also yeah. really good. That, that's selling me more on it um i don't know i think this card I think you'll need to play with it a little bit to figure out how good it is, but I think it'll be pretty obvious pretty quickly, um, just because it's a question. It's it's like a pseudo punisher, like the the matchups where this is a draw to are like you're on the draw versus an aggro deck, and those are usually not the matchups where you want to cast a two man spell that doesn't impact the board. But mm. if the things you're finding are good enough, it doesn't matter. Mm. Well, like, well, like they're playing like a dork, right? Like. If they're play if they're if they're a dork deck, this is 
Spookies is fine as well. Yeah, but those decks are more likely to miss their third land draw. Mm. And I don't think this is good if it's just one of the tutors. I think it kind of needs... I think it's It possible. needs to be both, most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, to because, like, one. yeah. I'm all, not I gonna say, all I was going to say is that, like, if you're playing a two-mana instant speed divination, you probably play Planet Far, Far Away. For the, if you want I mean, something more consistent. Like, yeah, it's also a tutor, but I'm saying, like, if you're, if, you're doing, if you're going in for the card advantage, then you probably play Planet, yeah. Okay, so next up we have Inked Summoner. Um, and so we kind of discussed briefly earlier about... Uh, uh the why are you like why are you punching your or like punching yourself uh aggro deck um and this is yeah. one of the main like incentives for that so it's one and a black for a one two At the beginning of your end step if you lost two or more life this turn you make a one one bird creature token with flying if you lost four or more life this turn create a three three black cat creature token with death touch and if you lost six or more life this turn create a five five black golem creature token with trample now we have shock fetches in this format, which make this trivial to enable the first mode. So then you can say like, okay, it's two two worth of stats, uh, basically immediately unless they have a instant speed removal spell, um, one of which is flying. Oh, sorry, two three worth of stats, uh, one of which is flying. But then you also have stuff like banished companion, which if you curve banished companion to this, oh, okay. Suddenly I paid uh, two mana for four five worth of stats that could only get better in the, in the coming turns, and so on and so forth. So I think this is like, again, like I think lots of the stuff that we talked about in terms of like, uh, how low can you go uh, safely, like also apply to this card, but it's overall still very powerful. So I think the other one was better though. Like I think the 4-4 case of losing four more life and being a 2-1 menace, is just so much better than the 3-3 three, three Death Toucher. And I think the 6 or more life is going to be this pipe dream that people build their decks in bad ways around um, to like try and unlock this like crazy mode, whereas they should have just shot for the more reliable 4-4. Four, four. So what I do like about this is that um, you can get recurring value with it over turns. So um, if, like, the the... The black red one can only get the token makes legendary, so you can't That's like fair. continually get creatures from this. And this can build up an army by itself, uh, just from you taking damage from your lands. It can it can make a board of flyers, and all you have to do is play a shock fetch every turn, or attack with a banish companion every turn, or whatever, right? Um, even if it's worse than the other one, I do think that redundancy is important, and having eight copies of this kind of effect at this mana slot is pretty useful for building this sort of deck. So I think decks that want Ink Summoner probably also want the other card and vice versa. Uh, I'm so sorry, I keep forgetting the name of the other card. Uh, it's um, Sukar, yeah. I definitely think the redundancy argument is an important one. Um, I think I'm a little bit soft. Like basically I don't think Bitter Blossom would be a particularly good card in MCM if it was legal. I think we can mostly agree that this is a worse Bitter Blossom. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to say that, yeah. The, so kind of beyond that, the question is, like, how often do you spike the higher value modes? Um, how often can you afford to do that before you just fucking die? Um, and how are you warping your deck? I agree that I, I like the redundancy. I just think that people should be more reliably doing a, like, if they're doing a 4-3 split, this should be the 3. Well, it is not legendary as well, is the other thing. Sukar is yeah. legendary. So but that's not a consideration. Sukar is just like that much stronger than this card. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, um, with Sukar, you can't do the chili thing of like, well, I'm going to discard multiple copies to yeah. pay itself, anyways. But yeah. Mm. Um, I just run another discard. I'm sure you can find some way to justify running discard. Oh, under it. There we go. We hey. hey. Let's go. <laughs> okay. But memes this aside, uh, I want to before we move on to our last card. I want to mention I okay. forgot to mention earlier. This is from Digital Heartbeat um, by Fifth okay. Dragon. So now we can move on to our last card of the review, Tiny Heroine Totti, which is from Fields of Gold by Canterbury Egg. 
So this is a three mana mono white planeswalker that combines a lot of um, kind of standards or classic white effects. Um, so your plus two makes it so that if your opponent has more life than you, you gain two life. Your plus one makes it that if an opponent controls more creatures than you, you create two one one knight white gnomes. So very standard like white parity effects. And our minus four, which is pretty achievable because you can plus two the turn she comes down and then minus four the next turn. You search your library for a creature card with convert a mana cost two and put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. So pretty good in like a toolbox a hate bears deck as well. The main power of this card though, I'd, I'd argue comes from the static, which is basically just Leon and Arbiter. So I think having that static on a Planeswalker is really powerful. The problem is like, if it's just uh, if she's just an enchantment with the with with that line, is she worth it? So I actually love this in um, slower mid range decks because this is an insanely good anti aggro card. Mm -hmm. um, if you drop this, and usually the plus two or the plus one are going to be active against an aggro deck. Both of them are very good. It's like a it's like a mini timely reinforcement that keeps happening every single turn. Your opponent has to deal with it immediately. It also slows down their fetch lands, um, has utility in shutting down various opposing tutors, whatever. And you can also just, you know, uh, search up whatever two drop you're running in your midrange deck. Maybe it's Bitter Duckling, maybe it's Anish Two, maybe it's Chili. Who knows, right? Mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I I think this card is a little bit hard to evaluate without playing it. Yada yada. Um, I definitely agree it is really powerful as an anti aggro tool. Um, it's not busted versus control, but like turning off or making their fetches plunker to use is not nothing. Um, and you can also like just plus two on empty air, build up the minus four faster. So it's not like, oh, well, they have less life than me, so I can't do anything. You can still like move towards the minus four. I think this card's just like solid. Um, I think it's really obnoxious if you play it turn two off a dork and your opponent didn't shock in their turn one fetch. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> like I think you can do some really kind of horrific griefer stuff with this. Um, if that's what you're into, which based on my MSCM experiences, a lot of people are. Guilty. Um, <laughs> but I I think this is this is a type of planeswalker where it's more in the war style where it is a planeswalker that's going to really subtly influence the game and you're not going to be fully aware of how much it fucked up for your opponent's game plan. Mm. It's never going to win you the game outright because you like drew four cards off of it and then slammed a game winning ultimate. It's going to win the game by just like saying, I made a couple tokens here. I got a creature that I wouldn't have otherwise found. Your mana was a turn slower than it would have been. You couldn't cast that tutor easily. And that's a very interesting type of power. Yeah, and also you you it needs to show up in a very specific kind of deck. Like you need to have good tutor targets for it most of the time. Um, you need to play to the board because this but is not bad. Like, but not too much. Yep, you need to be playing to the board more than the control decks and less than the aggro decks. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. So, uh, so anything else you want to say about it? Okay. No, and I think with that, we can call the review uh, wrapped up. So once again, thanks everyone for, uh, I guess, like watching this. Thanks again for Pipsqueak and Dodger for joining this. And for, for reference, this was recorded the day after the Mon review, which is why Kevin isn't here, because his, he was, his throat was shot after uh, yesterday's three hours. So Thanks so much to Dodger and Pip for being willing to sit with uh, sit with me for another two and a half hours the day right after. My so. pleasure. Yeah. It's one thirty my time, but I'm happy to have done this. Word. I don't we, have work we definitely tomorrow. appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I said I don't have work, so yeah, like... Oh, you don't have work tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, that's a lot better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to have links to the MSEM server in the description if you don't already play the format. I will also be hosting uh, drafts of MS3 uh, the Saturday and Sunday after this video comes out uh, at 11 a.m. PST and 5 p.m. PST each day. So if any of these cards excited you for limited, come through and play, uh, play some drafts. But yeah, once again, thank you for watching, and this is Caillou signing off.